just to introduce Dr. Rakan, Dr. Rakan Nadar, he is a senior consultant in uh, King Khaled University uh, Hospital, King Saud uh, University, King Saud University, and he is with great experience and a lot of uh, charity work, and um, and he is contributing uh, a lot in teaching the the, the residents. So. Dr. Rakan, if you want to start now or you want, you will... Uh, yes, the, I would it? love to start. Just one second. Let me just make sure that I got the screen right. Uh, uh, the, 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 the view speaker. Okay. So, uh, all right. Uh, do, do you guys see me? Yes. Okay. Uh, let me just see. Okay, so uh, uh, th thank you, Dr. Hussain, for uh, the nice introduction. Uh, it's really my honor and my pleasure, and I thank uh, Dr. Makhdoum, Fahad Makhdoum, to to have uh, introduced, to have allow, asked me to participate in this series. And uh, one of the things, every time something comes in mind as a review course is, is Ten years from now, when hopefully all of you have uh, you know, been become senior consultants, and somebody stops you uh, around the corridor and asks you, "What is cardiopulmonary bypass?" or "Can you give me a summary about ischemic mitral or mitral repair?" You can, within 10-20 minutes, clearly in a logical, thoughtful way, explain uh, the topic. So this is the intent of the review course. It's not a comprehensive uh, summary of everything in the science. Again, if each topic here, you can spend weeks and months trying to discuss and decipher uh, uh, yeah, what's, what's uh, concerned you know, with the particulate aspects. But what I, my intent today is mostly gonna be verbal. Uh, I hate, as you as you, said, you might know, I hate PowerPoint, I hate didactic sessions. I think uh, learning should be a, a, a hands-on experience. And uh, I want this session to be, please, interactive. So uh, it, uh, I don't know, how, how can we make it interactive, Hussein? You can ask case scenario and we will discuss it with you. Okay, excellent, excellent. So I think, can, can uh, 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 how can we allow people to participate? Is there, you know, can, they can go in and uh, decide, uh, because I can see all the microphones here are muted. Yeah, we can unmute and, and answer. Who, who, who does unmute? Uh, you or is, is it the admin or uh, everybody has the freedom to unmute? No, no, everybody has the freedom to unmute. Okay, so, so again, uh, what, what, what I would emphasize that please, anybody who has uh, a, a question or a, uh, uh, something to add, please uh, feel free to participate. So, I mean, uh, cardiopulmonary bypass, it's a huge topic. It's basically the essence of how cardiac surgery came to be as a specialty. I just want to reiterate some of the historical aspects because you cannot understand cardiopulmonary bypass without understanding how it began. As you all are well aware that the history of cardiac surgery has only started recently uh, in, in the last 50 to 60 years. Prior to this, it was clear convention amongst all surgeons that the heart is an, an inoperable organ. And this was evident by the earliest trials of Alexis Carell. Now, Carell is the father of vascular surgery and cardiovascular surgery, and he's the first person to have ever suggested in history and uh, when he was still a medical uh, resident, R1 resident, that you can suture blood vessels to each other. And uh, the story goes that he, it, he was a, a very gifted surgeon. It took him five minutes to sew an anastomosis. While the heart, while snaring the coronary, obviously, if, in order for you to, ser to sew an anastomosis, it takes uh, it take him three minutes, and he had to snare the coronary. Unfortunately, that uh, action of snaring the coronary made the heart fibrillate in three minutes. So again, there was a two-minute gap between the heart fibrillating and him finishing the anastomosis, and the, and 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 it was it was his intent to find a way to bypass the heart, sorry, just, and I'll, I sub substitute the circulation mechanically until the procedure or whatever on the heart is done. And uh, he, he did some experiments uh, with uh, Charles Lindbergh, the first person to human to ever cross uh, the Atlantic solo with an airplane. And they won the Nobel Prize for their work. 
Now, this was the earliest trials. You were talking about the early 1900s, 1920s. And then a concept came in, uh, in the early 1950s of total body hyperthermia. It was clearly understood that uh, from near drowning victims that subjecting the body to hypothermia reduced the dependence on oxygen and reduced the basal metabolic rate of the body. And uh, Dr. Lewis from Minnesota was the first one in 1952 to close ASDs using total body hypothermias. I'm sure some of you have saw, seen the pictures where they bring the patient anesthetized, usually a child, put him in a tub filled with ice and cold water, and they wait until the heart fibrillates. As soon as the heart fibrillates, they pick up the child, put him on the operating room table, do a right thoracotomy, go inside the heart, close uh, the ASD, usually primarily without a patch, because he only had five, 10 minutes to uh, do whatever you needed to do, and then gradually rewarm the patient and shock them until they regain a normal rhythm. And believe it or not, this method, as brutal as it seems nowadays, was very common practice. And uh, a lot of patients had this operation and some of them did survive to old age. Uh, one of the attempts also was, uh, again, the infamous cross circulation by Dr. Lilihai, again in Minnesota. You'll see a lot of the technology came from uh, uh, Minnesota uh, where Edwards company is based and uh, a lot of the companies that manufacture heart lung machines or technologies based on heart lung machines are, are, are situated over there. And again, the cross circulation was basically to use the parent or somebody who's blood compatible as the heart and lung machine while the heart is isolated, usually the right side of the, uh, of the circulation. 45 patients were done. So it wasn't until 1954 that William Gibbon in Philadelphia did the first prototype of what we now know as the heart lung machine. Uh, as you all know, heart lung machine is basically taking oxygen, the oxygenated blood, putting it inside a venous reservoir, pumping it to a an oxygenator. At the time, they used to use bubble oxygenators, which you can imagine caused a lot of air emboli, and pump it back to the patient. But it was William Gibbon in 1954 that opened the horizon for uh, cardiopulmonary bypass and allowed us to, you know, to proceed with the speciality. So. Uh, if I would ask, what are the components of a heart lung machine? Uh, the components we will start from the patient's right, right side. We uh, venous line, venous cannulas, venous line, the reservoir, uh, the uh, the pump, the oxygenator, the heat, uh, the heat exchanger, the oxygenator the arterial line and then the arterial cannula. So Excellent. Can so yeah, definitely uh, I would completely agree, but you made it more complex. So basically I would say that you have a venous reservoir, you have a pump, you have an oxygenator and that's it. So this is basically this is, and then you have an inflow and outflow cannulas. So basically, I mean, uh, no matter how complex a heart lung machine, these are the three main components, the venous reservoir, the pump, and the oxygenator. Now the heat exchange is, a, is an add-on, but again, you can still do heat exchange on the, on the body. It's obviously not as effective as doing heat exchange on, on, uh, on the blood itself, but again, uh, you can use the human body or the body of the, of the patient as for heat exchange. So it's not necessary that you, you need to have a heat exchanger, but obviously all uh, heart lung machines are equipped with, uh, with heat exchangers. The, so if I may ask another question is uh, the uh, cannulation, arterial cannulation. What are the sites of cannulation? Good morning, Dr. Rakan. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, so you have different sites for arterial cannulation, the central, uh, either central in the ascending aorta or uh, in the nominate, yes. at the base of the nominate uh, the artery. Also, we have peripheral cannulation. I can use a femoral artery. I can use also the axillary arteries, uh, especially in cases of aneurysm or dissection. Uh, also, sure. there is a report for carotid artery uh, to be cannulated uh, for, for a ladder. Also, there is uh, apex. Uh, there is a, some uh, some uh, some paper showing that I can can you yes. through the apex, but it's rare. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. What, what yes. I ended. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, so definitely, I would agree with you, Dr. Haytham. So basically, we would divide the arterial cannulation into central and peripheral. Central, as you indicated, it's usually the ascending aorta, but sometimes you can cannulate, even in aneurysm cases, when there's no dissection, you can cannulate the distal arch. You dissect the arch distally long enough and just you can cannulate in, in the arch and you can cannulate the innominate. Peripherally, I would absolutely agree. Axillary is usually my prefer preferred site, but femoral artery is also a, a site and carotid. Apical, honestly, I've read about it. I've, I know some one or two people from the old days who've done it, but uh, I think it's fallen out of favor now for obvious reasons. Uh, and for the, venous, for the venous site, what are the sites of cannulation? Central and, and uh, right, um, right atrium or uh, di direct uh, SVC and uh, IVC. You can do mm -hmm. it um, um, peripheral, femoral, or, uh, or through jugular in, in case of uh, minimal invasive. Yes, absolutely. So again, you're more limited with the venous sites and you're limited to either, again, central and peripheral. Central is usually the right atrium, uh, atrium or the bicaval cannulation. And peripheral, usually we have two sites, usually the internal jugular and the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the femoral vein. Okay, now, one of the things I really need to emphasize is, again, this is more of a practical point rather than a theoretical point, is snares. What is the role of the snare? snare if you want to operate on the... Um, snare to hold the cannula in place. Okay, so the snare, to hold the cannula in place. Anybody has other suggestions? Uh, unless you mean snaring of the I, uh, SVC and uh, IVC. No, 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 no. I, mean, I, meant, I meant the snares to, uh, to hold the cannula. But do, do snares alone hold the cannula? No, you have to, to put a tie around decrease, it. Decrease okay, so this is, this is the <laughs> most important thing that I want everybody here in the group to know. The snares on and of themselves do not hold the cannula in place. What holds the cannula is the small tie that you tie around the cannula and the snare. This is what here. So the snare is basically, it's like you're putting a, uh, a, uh, a, uh, uh, a, 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 what, what do they call it? Uh, uh, it's like, you know, when they're building skyscrapers, they usually use T-bars, iron T-bars. So these are the things that are the foundation where you can build upon. And it's very important to ensure that when you do, especially the arterial cannulation, is that the snares are not enough to hold your cannula in place. What holds the cannula in place is again, the silk tie that you tie around the cannula, around the snare. Is that clear? Yes. Yeah. Because again, there will be scenarios and I'm sure in your practice, you will have a few, hopefully not more than one or two, decannulation accidents. And believe me, when they do happen, it's a big, big mess. And a lot of the time, it's fatal. All right, so that out of the way. Now, how do you monitor anticoagulation? Um, through the ACT. Hey, why, why not use PTT or INR? Uh, PTT and INR, it will take time. And, uh, ACT, it is uh, fast, and I can obtain the result uh, very fast, apart from the <laughs> INR and the PTT, which need uh, 20 to 30 minutes to, uh, for, for the result to be out. And, uh, it's more, and, it's, and it's more accurate in high concentration of heparin. Okay, wonderful. So basically, there will be situations where, or which I'm going to discuss where you're going to rely on PTT. You know what the, what the situation is, particular situation? Uh, when I'm not using the heparin, pelveridine, if I use in head so, cases, pelveridine, uh, I think I need to go with the PTT. However, Excellent. I can also so again, use an ACT. Yes. So again, there will be some times where you are not allowed to use heparin. Fortunately, it's very rare. 
usually with uh, a heparin induced thrombocytopenia active with active antibodies in circulation. So the, and if you have to operate, then you would uh, uh, use alternatives to heparin. And usually you use direct antithrombin inhibitors and argatropan is the commonly used. Heridin uh, used to be used in the old days. Uh, not I think, but I think now the, 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 uh, the protocol is to go for argatropan. And the way you monitor argatropan is through PTT. Okay, what's the loading dose of heparin? Three, uh, three to four milligram, that's equal to 300 to 400 per, kilo, per kilogram. Excellent. So each milligram is about, so we, we in, in heparin always speak in units. So uh, uh, I, I think this is the common practice is units of heparin. Uh, I don't know what is it nowadays in the new textbooks, but uh, it used to be units and uh, I think it still is. So I uh, usually one, uh, one, uh, gra uh, one milligram of heparin is about 100 units. And as you, as, you said, as you indicated, usually the loading dose is anywhere between 300 to 400, sometimes 500 units per kg. So if you're talking about an adult uh, patient, usually the loading dose is 30 to 35,000 units of heparin. Uh, and what's the ACT that would allow you to go to bypass? The, the, the best one, it's 400, or safest one, 480 but we can go above 400 or in some, if we cannot reach that, the, we, the lowest one we can 390. Okay, I, I, I would agree. So usually it's the safest, again, when they label these uh, uh, benchmarks, usually they're very generous. So a, a lot of the time, 400 is enough for you to go and bypass safely. But just to ensure that it's applicable across all spectrums of patients, usually they recommend 480 to before you initiate cardiopulmonary bypass. So will there be situations where you've given the loading dose of heparin and uh, the ACT is still subtherapeutic? Yes, and inhibiting resistance. Okay, and oh, how do and you fix that? You, you give more, more heparin and uh, you, you have um, option depending on the hospital to give FFB or, um, or um, antithrom antithrombin-3. So why, why do you give FFP? <laughs> because it's contain, it's, it's contain antith antithrombin-3 and heparin to work, it's need antith it's augment action of antithrombin-3. Excellent, excellent. So this is basically the basic mechanism that we all studied in medical school of heparin. It does not act directly. It potentiates the action of antithrombin-3. It augments the action. So an antithrombin-3 is prevalent in plasma. So when you have heparin resistance, it's either because you need, so usually the first line, you don't give FFP immediately. What you give, you give another, uh, not necessarily loading dose, but usually we give 5,000 units of heparin ex extra. Why 5,000 units of heparin is just an easy number to remember. So people would say, you know, uh, just give, give an extra 5,000. And you wait for the ACT. If the ACT does not budge, then I would consider giving FFP, uh, four units of FFP or two units of FFP. And usually, usually by that time, the uh, ACT starts to, uh, to increase. Uh, just again, we've touched upon this topic. When are you not allowed to use heparin? In case of uh, acute head that happen uh, that occur on, on the patient at that time, I cannot use an, I cannot use an heparin as anticoagulation strategy, or if the patient is allergic to the to uh, to the heparin as well, at that time I cannot sure. use the heparin. I, I need to use an alternative uh, uh, alternative uh, drug uh, for anticoagulation. Okay, so even in the, case me, of it's not even in case it's not acute. Uh, if anti if uh, anti 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 antibody it's still positive in the blood, we cannot use it. Okay, so let me give you a scenario. You want to operate on somebody, and uh, you know they've had some uh, operations before, possibly DVT or whatever, and they've been exposed to heparin in the past. Definitely, they're exposed to heparin during uh, uh, angioplasty or angiography. 
and uh, uh, the patient has uh, hit antibodies, and they're referred to you to undergo cabbage. So what would you do? Urgent surgery, I will wait, then I will measure later the antibody uh, in, in, uh, in his blood. If it is declining, usually it takes one month to two months. If it is declined, I can uh, expose him again to the heparin and do the, uh, do the operation on heparin. Otherwise, I need to choose alternative uh, methods, which is uh, uh, agrotropan and uh, conduct my, uh, my cardiomyopathy bypass on the alternative uh, drug. Okay, so excellent. So basically, what you need to do is detect the antibodies. Even if somebody has hit a positive, or uh, sorry, some hit history, and the antibodies are undetected in the plasma, then you can go and proceed with the heparin only once. So you well, only get one chance with heparin. Uh, how many days does it take for the hit antibodies to appear after the introduction of heparin? Uh, I call five, five to seven days. I okay, to so usually what they say for naive patients to develop hit antibodies, it's usually 14 days after for, for first exposure. For re-exposure, it's usually four days. So it's four and 14. Easy number to remember. Wada? Wada. Okay, so basically if you have somebody who used to be hit positive, and now has no detected levels of antibodies, then you can go ahead, use heparin only once. Because again, within four days, you're gonna have HET antibodies. But let's suppose you have a HET positive and the antibodies that is there. As Dr. Haitham indicated, you have to, usually I would, it would be actually, I would, so they, the textbooks say you wait 50 to 60 days for the antibodies level to trend down or to disappear from detectable levels. But usually we say uh, uh, three months. And then you would test for the antibody. If the antibodies are undetected, then you can go ahead and proceed with your surgery. But as, as Dr. Haitham indicated, if you need to operate urgently, and then the only alternative is to use a direct thrombin inhibitors like argatropan. Uh, and uh, there is clear protocols. I don't remember the protocol, but uh, if you need to, op I've did it once before, and uh, you have to actually go and review with the with your uh, uh, in-house pharmacist to review the protocol for agatropan. It's available online. Clear? Yes. Okay. Uh, the other thing is when you're cannulating peripherally. So let's suppose you're doing an auxiliary cannulation then usually how much heparin do you give before you start uh, doing the cannulation? Um, you, you give a small amount, it's around 3,000. 3, 3, it's yeah, not, okay. it's so not full heparin. heparin. 3,000 3, 3, to 5,000. 5, I usually give 5,000. I'm a bit more generous. So if I'm doing an auxiliary cannulation because you, wanna, you don't want to you don't wanna do the, uh, the sternotomy on full heparin. So what I do is I start the case by doing my femoral or auxiliary cannulation, and I give before I, uh, I uh, you know, uh, 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 snare or clamp the vessel, I give 5,000 units of heparin, wait for one minute, and then start uh, snare the vessel and open the vessel and do my anastomosis. So uh, again, it's our cannulation, peripheral cannulation. So usually it's three to 5,000 units of heparin for peripheral. And then after you do the sternotomy, then and you're ready to go on bypass, you give the full dose of heparin. All right, okay. So what, uh, what, what, uh, what pumps are there? What type of pumps uh, in terms of the actual pumping mechanism? Uh, Ulnar and centrifugal. Excellent. So, what's the uh, uh, advantage and disadvantage of each? Um, the the centrifugal pump it's sensitive to after after load. So, if there is increase in after load, it's it will stop. But in ruler uh, ruler pump, it will not stop. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is uh, this is one. Uh, one disadvantage of the centrifuge. Any any other advantage disadvantage? Um, the the tube the tube damage will be um, more in ruler bump and uh, 
blood element damage will be more with centrifugal pump. Uh, you sure? Dr. Hussain, you're sure of this information? Both. Both will be more in a uh, ruler bump. Now, which is more damaging to the blood components? The ruler bump. The ruler or centrifugal? No, ruler. Akid? Akid. <laughs> okay, so I agree. So basically, the ruler pump is the, so the, the, the is, is more, it's a mechanical, so you're squeezing the tube. And every mm. time you squeeze the tube, you're definitely gonna cause some RBC hemolysis, some denaturation of proteins. So usually, and this is why we do not recommend using a, a ruler pump for more than four to six hours. While the centrifugal pump, you can use it for ECMO, 48 hours, sometimes five days because it's, mu it's much gentler on the blood components. The biggest issue with the centrifugal pump, it's preload and afterload dependent. Uh, if, I'm sure uh, a lot of you and some of you uh, have seen ECMO patients. Now, if you wanna increase the flow, you do not increase ramp up the RPMs of the uh, ECMO. For example, let's suppose your centrifugal pump is doing 3,000, 3,500 RPMs. If you increase it to 6,000 RPMs, in fact, what will happen is your blood flow will drop. The only way for you to increase the flow in the centrifugal pump is to give preload and to vasodilate the patient. So with centrifugal pump, controlling the hemodynamics, it's more tricky. This is one thing with the uh, disadvantage of centrifugal pump. But there is another, uh, other than being much <coughs> gentler on the, um, on, the, uh, on, on the blood components, there's another advantage to centrifugal pump. Anybody knows? First of all, had, had anybody had had any experience with centrifugal pumps in the operating room during routine oh, cases okay. like cabbage or mitral valve? In many bypass, in many bypass uh, cases, but uh, yes, as you said, it is the, the controlling of hemodynamics was so difficult on, on the perfusionist, and uh, with any minimal air, the bump stops. Excellent. So, so, but there is an advantage. So, you said it's a mini bypass machine. So, usually the size of the machine is much smaller. It's more miniature. The other advantage of centrifugal pumps, because I used them for a while when I was a resident, is that uh, you get great venous return. Uh, you can put a very small cannula in the right atrium and still maintain uh, excellent flow, because again, you're not dependent on gravity, and you don't, it's like you have vacuum suction on the venous side, and that allows you to uh, go with small cannulas and keep your machine small. But definitely, it's much more difficult to control the hemodynamics. And the most dreadful thing, it's a closed circuit. So any air in the venous line has the risk to travel to the arterial side. Usually now, usually on the arterial side, there's a bubble trap. So any small uh, fractions of air can be trapped, but uh, big amounts of air will definitely stop the pump. If you're lucky, sometimes it can escape and uh, go in the arterial line which believe me, it's not, not a pleasant situation. Okay, so, and, and then again, again, for most, for, for the greater part, in the operating rooms, we're all gonna use mostly nowadays ruler pumps. For ECMO, uh, LVADs, and what, what have you, we will be using centrifugal pumps. Okay, uh, the flow. What's the flow on the heart lung machine? What, what do you tell, or what does your perfusion, how does your perfusionist calculate the flow? He calculates the, <clears throat> the flow to keep the index more than 2.5, and that's depend on the, on the temperature of the patient. The, if the temperature decreases, we can decrease the, the, the flow. Excellent. Exactly. So basically, 2.5 is very generous. I usually say the normal index is more in most people is between 2.2 to 2.5. Now remember, the patient is anesthetized. There is not a lot, there is not a huge metabolic demand. So you're basically basal metabolic rate. So at basal metabolic rate, even two, two to point, uh, 2.2, 2.2, uh, 
a liters per meter square body surface area is adequate enough to at temperatures 38. Def, as, as you indicated, Dr. Hussain, uh, the lower you go with the temperature, the less flow you required. So, uh, I'll, I'll, I, and, and there's another thing that you require less. So for example, let's suppose I'm doing a circuit rest case and the uh, perfusionist is complaining that the venous return is not enough and the temperature is 28. So I would ask the perfusion, what is your index? If he is maintaining flow at an index of, let's say, 2.2 or 2.5, then that's not necessary. Then the perfusionist can or has to drop the flow to match the body demand. Because again, you're flowing, you're overflowing the flow that the body does not need. So usually what I say, again, and try, I mean, when I prepared this, this talk, I prepared from the top of my head. This is information that I have in my gray matter for the last 5, 10, 15 years. And this is the information that all of you should have in your mind when you're conducting any case. So usually at 38, I would ask my perfusionist to keep an index of 2.2. At temperature of 28 to 30, I would tell my perfusionist to keep an index of 1.8. At temperature 25, 1.6. At temperatures less than 20, I would usually ask the perfusionist to keep an index of one liter. And again, you might differ on these numbers. They're not engraved in stone. They're not from the heavens. But always keep in mind a general reference of the numbers. 2.2 for normothermia, for uh, deep hypothermia, you use one. And anywhere between is 1.6 to 1.8. Clear? Yeah. Okay. The other thing is, how much does your basal metabolic rate decrease with every uh, the degree decrease? Anybody? Five to any seven percent. Or calculation? Five to seven percent. If we decrease 10, um, 10 Celsius, that means fifty percent decrease in metabolic rate. Excellent. So, so keep in mind two things. When we talk about hypothermia, that is the body basal <laughs> metabolic rate which is concerned with the body, with the total body, your muscles, your bowel, your livers, your kidney, and there's the brain. Remember that the brain is different than the rest of the body. The brain consumes 20% of your oxygen. It's the highest organ that consumes oxygen. So you cannot treat the brain the same way as you treat the body. So as a general rule, we say for the body, for every 10 Celsius, your basic met basal metabolic rate is reduced by 50%. But the brain is different. The brain, I usually go with a rest time, an ischemic time. So for example, when your temperature is 28, your basal metabolic rate is at 50% of what it was at 38. But the brain, let, let, we can, the brain, I usually look at it at a different way. So let's suppose at 38, how much does your brain, or how, how much time does your brain tolerate before you start to see ischemic damage? At 38. 20, 20, uh, 38, it will take around 20 minutes or less. No, 38. No, 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 brain. no. For the brain. Two, one, one to two minutes. So usually they say, if you read the ACLS protocols, they say four minutes. So you have to restore this. So <laughs> believe me, I've been in situations where patients were, had no flow for or at normothermia for four to five minutes and they still woke up. So I believe that number. So, you know, I think four minutes might sound scary, but it's still the, you know, the upper limit of how much you, the brain can tolerate before significant damage starts to take place at temperature 38. Let's say at temperature 30, how much? 38, sorry, I had 28, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So uh, at, at 28, now, okay, at 28, 28 to 30, what's the time? It's less than 10 minutes. Less than 10, I usually say eight minutes, so you double the time. <clears throat> All right. Okay. Between 20 and 25, how many minutes? 20 to 25, it's two, oh. 20 minutes, 20 minutes. 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes. At temperature 18, how many minutes or 15? For 45, oh. some book mentions 60 minutes. Oh. Okay, excellent, excellent. So definitely you don't want <clears throat> to see, so usually they say at 18 Celsius, 
<clears throat> or 15 Celsius, you have 60 minutes. I think 60 minutes is very, very generous. I usually try to keep my circa rest time less than 45 minutes, if I can. If, you, if you're gonna exceed the 45 minute mark, then you have to get some sort of uh, brain protection, auxiliary uh, adjunct brain protection, meaning you either give anti-grade perfusion or perfuse through the auxiliary by ensnaring the innominate or give uh, retrograde cerebral perfusion. But uh, uh, as, as, uh, as our residents know, I'm a big fan of deep hyperthermia alone, provided that you have cooled the brain long enough. So usually if I'm doing a dissection or root replacement or whatever, I finish, I spend two hours fixing the root or whatever I need to do in the proximal part. And then <laughs> the two hours will give me ample time to ensure that the brain is uniformly cold. And then at 18 Celsius, I have a good 40 to 45 minutes to fix everything. 60 minutes is the maximum, but uh, you know, you do really don't want to get to 60 minutes without giving some uh, extra protection. So is it clear? So you can still do circa rest at 30 or 28 Celsius, but your time is going to be very, very narrow. And I know only a few surgeons who can guarantee to do a distal anastomosis in less than 15 minutes. And usually if you, if you do a distal anastomosis in that short amount of time, believe me, it's a shitty anastomosis. It's going to bleed like hell. So the best thing is uh, you take no risk, cool the patient down uh, for uh, as low as it you can go, 18 Celsius, for as long as possible, and then circa rest. <laughs> do you need to give adjunct cerebral protection? Different philosophies, different schools. I strongly believe that when you're giving any ischemic organ some sort of flow, you're basically creating more free radicals. Because again, you have in the mitochondrial membrane, a lot of electrons are being released because there's no oxygen to keep the gradient flowing. So the electrons are floating around in the mitochondria. And then when you decide to give some anti-grade cerebral protection, you're delivering small amounts of oxygen. That's not enough to keep the organ functional, but enough to create enough small free radicals that can cause membrane damage and organ dysfunction and cellular dysfunction. So this is why I'm a big fan of just deep hyperthermia alone, as long as you can keep the time limited. If the time exceeds 45 minutes or 60 minutes, then definitely you need to give some form of uh, uh, cerebral protection. Anybody has any thoughts around this or uh, any ideas? Nothing? Dr. Rakan, some surgeon or some book, they, 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 they claim if we do retrograde cerebral protection, it will wash the debris on the on the brain. So it's true, that. True. True. Well, the problem is I'm not sure that it watches from the brain. When you're giving blood, so you, when you're giving retrograde cerebral protection, uh, what, what are you perfusing? The, the venous system. Which part of the venous system? Where? Which veins? The veins and, in the brain, the veins in the face, the veins in the thyroid. And the brain. Uh, you cannot tell. So basically, if you look at your anatomy, most of the venous supply is in your face. In your facial muscles, in your nose, in your thyroid. These are the vascular rich areas, much more, much more rich than the brain. So when you're giving retrograde uh, venous uh, perfusion through the SVC, the blood coming, the dark blood coming out to you is not mostly not coming from the brain. Most of it is coming from the facial veins. <coughs> so yeah. to think, you know, the only thing I would guarantee that you're washing out the air bubbles in the brain. But again, if you had the head, the head in the, in the uh, deep Trindlenburg position, then there is no way for usually air to escape inside uh, or to, to accumulate inside the brain. And whatever blood you're getting in the SVC is basically coming from the facial veins. Okay, clear. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so again, this is, this is my... And again, I've, I've had a good experience with just deep hypothermia alone. But again, 
it's one of these things that, that are convictions. There's no clear cut science. You cannot put clear cut science. And by the way, there is some literature out there that shows patients who have deep hyperthermia alone have better neurocognitive or less neurocognitive dysfunction than patients who have adjunct cerebral uh, anti-grade or retrograde protection. And the theory is, as I said, is less free radicals, less uh, reactive oxygen species floating around, uh, around the neurons when, when you just use deep hyperthermia alone. All right. Uh, let's go on to myocardial protection. Why do you need to give myocardial protection? So I don't want, because I don't want uh, to end up with, uh, uh, with the death of the myocardium itself. Okay, good. So basically, if you look, and, and again, I, I do advise all of you to read more about, you know, as surgeons, we're used to doing mechanical things. We just deliver cardioplegia. We, do, we say myocardial protection not knowing exactly what's the molecular and subcellular mechanisms that allows us to do this. If you do an electron microscopy of the myocardium, of the cardiac myocytes, you will find peculiar things. Number one, the myocardium has the highest concentration of mitochondria in any cellular structure in the body. About one third of your mitochondria, this is in your usual patients. Uh, I consider myself an athlete. So my mitochondria and my myocardium are going to be more than 50% of the myocardial cell, uh, weight. Because again, one of the adaptive mechanisms to exercise, how exercise improves your performance is, is something we call mitochondria, mitochondrial biogenesis. So yes. basically through the induction of exercise, you induce more mitochondria formation. And the heart being an organ that continues to beat from the time you're uh, four or five weeks gestational age until the last breath you take on this planet, your heart is constantly beating without strain, without, uh, usually, without, uh, without fatigue. And the only way the heart is allowed to do that is through generating huge amounts of energy, usually in the form of ATP. So the, myo the, uh, the myocardium has high mitochondrial concentration. In fact, the cardiac myocytes are the only cells that have mitochondria between cells. Usually the mitochondria is a subcellular structure, so it's within the cell membrane. But the cardiac myocytes actually have mitochondria in and outside of the cardiac membrane, because again, they're so dependent on mitochondria to generate energy. So usually, in let's say a relaxed state, <coughs> heart is beating, what's the myocardial oxygen demand? Seventy-five percent, you mean? Eighty, seventy-five to eighty percent of your oxygen. No, but in terms of again, 10, these are numbers 10, 10 I wish ML, to you. Exactly. 10 ML, yes. So 10 this ML is the magic number. Hundred gram. Exactly. So basically, <coughs> I think it's, it's 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 is it one gram or a hundred gram? I think it's one gram. Ten ML per gram per minute. So basically, when your heart is beating at a resting state. Let's say the patient is anesthetized, you haven't gone on bypass yet, that myocardium <coughs> is consuming about 10 mLs of oxygen per gram per minute. How much is that now when you go on cardiopulmonary bypass without applying the cross cut, just going on cardiopulmonary bypass and unloading the heart? Six mL. Actually, Actually, uh, it's 60%, so 4 mL. So you, you drop from uh, 10 mL per minute to 4 mL per minute. So just the act of uh, decompressing and unloading the heart while it's still beating reduces the myocardial oxygen demand by 60%. So this is a very important thing to know. And again, you'll see the heart beating nicely and okay. As soon as you start to load the heart and try to come off bypass, there is more strain on the ventricular wall that increases myocardial oxygen demand. And if you have issues in your coronary blood flow or a myocardial dysfunction, the heart is gonna fail. So just the act of going on cardiopulmonary bypass reduces your myocardial oxygen demand. 
So uh, uh, will a fibrillating heart and bypass consume the same amount as a beating heart and bypass? Or this? No, fibril no or fibrillating more, more. fibrillating yeah. consume more. Exactly. So a fibrillating heart will consume the six mLs per gram per minute. So again, fibrillation, when the heart is fibrillation, fibrillating, it's still consuming uh, more than the usual amount of oxygen for an unloaded heart that's beating in sinus rhythm. And when you arrest the heart in diastolic state, how much does the myocardial oxygen demand go down? One ml. One ml. Excellent. So uh, I'm glad that you memorized say, these numbers because these numbers I remembered as a student and I still, uh, or as a resident, junior resident, and I still keep it because it allows me to calculate how much cardioplegia I need to get and how much myocardial protection. Just going on bypass alone reduces your myocardial oxygen demand by 60%. Arresting the heart in a diastolic state will reduce your myocardial oxygen demand by 90% from 10 to 1 ml. And this is without hyperthermia, without nothing. By the way, hyperthermia does very little to reduce the myocardial oxygen demand. It adds another 5%. So you come down from 90% to 95% reduction in myocardial oxygen demand. So again, the most important thing in myocardial protection and reducing the myocardial oxygen demand is to have a diastolic arrest. Now, um, how, how do we achieve diastolic arrest? Um, I have by, by, cardioplegic, cardioplegic solution. So mm -hmm. uh, we have intracellular and extracellular. Usually we give high potassium. Uh, the high potassium mm -hmm. would lead to a state of cardioplegic uh, uh, cardioplegic uh, cardiac arrest in diastole with a high uh, okay so diastolic arrest but in which state uh, if we if we are talking about uh, voltage wise or uh, electro uh, 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 electrical activity which uh, what do we call when you give high potassium and the heart stops it stops in a diastolic state and, yeah, what phase and, in the, and in the depolarization. 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 So basically, and intracellular, what and intracellular hyper. repolarization. Hyper. Prevent repolarization. So, yes. Yeah. So basically, what happens? So, uh, by the way, do you guys do you guys see me? I brought my wife's. Uh, my wife gives online classes. So, uh, let's see here. Okay. By the way, are we running short in time or we're okay, Dr. Haitham? No, no, it's okay, perfect. Uh, all the time you need, Dr. Haitham. Okay, good. So basically, I hope this is clear. It's, I wish I had my, my view here much better. Uh, no, I cannot. Oh, it's it's uh, clear. It's clear, uh, it's, just, uh, it's just my side here. Okay, anyway, so what happens here, so here you have, so before that, before that, let me just, this is basic things, but again, please remember these because you're gonna be busy with your career. And if you do not memorize these things at this stage, believe me, you're not gonna memorize them when you're a full-fledged uh, busy consultant doing you know, operation in four or five different hospitals. So resting membrane, resting membrane potential. So let's say this is the cell membrane. So you have high uh, sodium outside, you have potassium here. Okay. So what's the resting membrane potential usually here in the cardiac myocyte? Um, between minus 60 and minus 90. It's minus 90. So usually in, in the usual muscle and the nerve conduct in the nerve tissue, it's minus, uh, I think it's minus 60, but in cardiac myocyte, it's minus 90 millivolt. What keeps this membrane negative, membrane potential negative? What are the things that keeps this negative? ATPs and pumping on and out the uh, sodium okay. and potassium. So ATP, it pumps three sodium out and two potassium in. So ATPA, so you're kicking out more sodium outside and less potassium inside. Both of them are cations, but you're, you're, you're keeping a higher concentration of cations outside the cell. This is number one. Number two? Um, 
the the hyd the hyd the hydrogen and ca and uh, calcium. No, not 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 in resting membrane potential. Anything else? What's inside the cell here? Proteins. Proteins are full of. Are, what, what's usually the charge of proteins? The hydroxyl group uh, proteins. <coughs> It's, usually it's, they're it's negative positive. Charge. Negative? Negative. Proteins are negative usually. Sam, um, I'm not sure, Salah. Okay, so take it from me. Protein, as a result of the hydroxyl groups that are uh, uh, associated with it, are usually negatively charged. So, and they're too big to cross the cell membrane. Okay, proteins and phosphates are usually intracellular, which are, uh, uh, these are anions, negatively charged. And they're too big to cross over the cell membrane. Another last thing that keeps the cell membrane potential is the leak channels. Now leak channels, they leak what? Yalla ya jama'a ya surgeons. Waters? No. By the way, water freely derived. It doesn't need leak channels. Water can go in and outside the cell, while well, otherwise cells will die. Calcium? No, no I'm not sure. I'm just guessing. <laughs> okay. oh, need, Potassium leak channels. That. So these are leak channels that... Are, and this is how <clears throat> your... Ever wondered how your sinus nod is automated? How does the sinus not constantly fire at a rate of 60 to 100? How do you control that? By controlling the leak channels, because if the leak channels open up widely, you have more potassium, uh, uh, sorry, not close. If your leak channels close, then you will have potassium accumulating inside the cell and gradually your cell mem uh, resting membrane potential from go up from minus 90 to minus 20, which is, what is, called, what is minus 20 called? The threshold. Threshold, threshold. Oh, yeah, jama'a, well, I'm Leicester. Come on, guys. So when your leak channels closes, you start accumulating potassium inside the cell because it's not leaking outside. So your resting membrane potential will go from minus 90 to minus 20, and this is the point of no return. There is what? Uh, Action potential. Period. Action potential. So you get an SA not firing. If you have the leak channel <clears throat> open widely, then you get more negative and you start, you reduce the heart rate. So. The automaticity of the myocardium and the conductive tissue of the heart is based solely on the leak potassium channels by controlling them. So when you start to rhythmically close down the leak channel, the potassium leak channels, you rhythmically get firing and action potential. <coughs> so this is clear? Yes. Again, please, please guys, understand these are fundamental physiologic mechanisms. You cannot understand myocardial protection and cardioplegia without understanding how these things work. Okay, so let's get to back to the action potential. So <coughs> here you have the SA not firing because you have the, the potassium leak channel. So what goes inside the cell here at this phase? Um, sodium. Sodium, so sodium goes inside here, the cell. And what happens, the resting membrane potential will increase. Okay, and what happens here? What Bota opens up? Potassium and calcium. And potassium. Excellent. So potassium will start. So there's buildup of sodium inside the cell, more positive charges. And then the cell, the, so both sodium and potassium channels are activated simultaneously, but potassium a, a voltage activated potassium channels, they're delayed, they, they lag behind. They're much slower to open and much slower to close. So when you reach the apex of the action potential here, your potassium channels will open and 
potassium will start escaping the cell and then you start the, uh, the membrane potential will start to come down. And here there is calcium that goes in and calcium. potassium that goes out. This is the plateau. And then the calcium will stop, all the potassium will come out and then you have hyperrepolarization and then resting membrane potential and it so goes on. So when you have high potassium concentration outside, what happens to this potassium? It will not go out. Excellent. Okay. So when the potassium wants to go out, so you get a state of persistent depolarization. depolarization. So, uh, okay, depolarize. And this is what we mean by depolarization. You're, you're, you're choking, you're stifling the potassium inside the cell. Potassium cannot go outside there. And this is a key component of, of, uh, of my, uh, you know, blood cardio or potassium-based cardioplegia. So this was, by the way, this was accidentally discovered because, again, they realized back in the day that giving high potassium concentration, potassium chloride, caused myocardial depression and arrhythmias. And at some point, there was a solution called the Hartman solution that was experimental. And it was found to be very effective in, uh, in suppressing the myocardium. Uh, has anybody heard of the Hartman solution? The, the initial one without adding of, uh, there was a lack of uh, uh, calcium on it. And initially it yeah. was leading. This but there is was the one, a right? big flaw with the Hartman solution. Anybody knows what that was? And, uh, and cardiac in the stone heart, you mean? Yeah, but there was an issue. So basically, uh, just to cut... The it's contained, shot, it's contained it calcium. huge concentrations um, of potassium. Of calcium. Uh, potassium, and, okay. And so. it caused myocardial necrosis. So it was very effective in suppressing the heart. The problem is it killed the heart. So uh, it caused myocardial necrosis. So uh, it was oh. abandoned for a while. And then uh, uh, 30 or 40 years ago, it was reintroduced. So... For many years, we've been conducting open heart surgery without potassium cardioplegia. And we were relying on other stuff, which I'm going to get into. So again, potassium, by the way, is something very recent that we started experimenting with. Because for a while, we thought that potassium was so toxic that it killed cardiac myocytes. Uh, who's the father of cabbage surgery? Gibbon? No, the, for the cardiac uh, bass. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm uh, not no saying who first performed cabbage. A lot of people have, uh, yani have the honor. The, 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 the one uh, who died recently, there is a one said yes, who died recently in the Cleveland Clinic. Oh my God, I forget his name. He's the one inventing a lot of things. Yes, he was one of the first people to do cabbage. But the one who really popularized cabbage and made it common practice and was very effective was <coughs> Denton no. Cooley. Cooley, okay. Okay. <clears throat> So, do you know how Denton Cooley back in the 70s did cabbage? <coughs> uh, he was applying cross clamp on and off. Exactly. So, Denton Cooley was a very, was notoriously fast. He was one of the fastest surgeons that ever existed. And the way he did cabbage was simply put a cross clamp on the heart. It's called normothermic ischemia. And the heart would fibrillate. He would do all of his distals within 20 minutes, finish all the distals, and then take out the cross clamp and do the proximals with a side biting clamp. Now, this is the time when we discovered something called stone hearts. Anybody knows what a stone heart is? Stone heart when you have a lot of accumulation of the calcium because of Excellent. the... So the heart is not in a depolarized state, is in, an, in a polarized action potential state. It's, it's not diastolic arrest. It's systolic arrest. And sometimes, by the way, I still see it once every while when I give cardioplegia, I always have the routine of feeling the left ventricle. And mm -hmm. sometimes you give adequate cardioplegia and the root is, has adequate pressure, yet the heart feels like stone. And then in that situation, what you do is you stop the cardioplegia, you decompress the heart and give cardioplegia again. So stone heart is a term that we discovered that for people who exceeded 20 minutes normothermic ischemia, ended up with what we call stone hearts, basically, and these hearts were literally dead. They never came off bypass. 
So, and the time that was found, this is where, by the way, the 20 minutes is arbitrary. When we say you give cardioplegia every 20 minutes based on this observation that people observed that if you had the heart ischemic for more than 20 minutes, you ended up with a stone heart. This is now before the time people gave cardioplegia. So this is one method of myocardial protection is normothermic ischemia. The another method is a fibrillating heart. Uh, mm -hmm. And one of the uh, strategies of uh, doing uh, coronary bypass or cabbage in patients with calcified aorta is fibrillating the heart. Anybody has any experience with uh, heart, fibrillating heart surgery? No, only the principal. No. Unfortunately, I didn't attend any case. Uh, yeah, so it's, 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 it's out of practice most of the time. And I think the only indication would be uh, is uh, a calcified aorta. Plus, I mean, there are so many other alternatives to fibrillating heart. But basically, a fibrillating heart surgery is basically you go and bypass, uh, you uh, decompress the left ventricle through the right superior pulmonary vein and give electrical shocks. Now there is a, uh, unfortunately I had it and then I had to give it back. It's called a fibrillating box. It's a small box that delivers uh, exact voltage, usually I think 10 or 12 millivolts uh, to uh, myocardium on the T wave and causes the heart to fibrillate. And then you do your distal uh, anastomosis and uh, the proximal you can do it under circ arrest, uh, short, uh, you know, or low flow circ arrest. And then when you're done, you just shock the heart again and uh, the heart beats back again. So again, fibrillating heart surgery is one of the ways of myocardial protection that used to be in practice. So now, usually, but, kind of, usually okay. Kurakan currently nowadays, so the maybe I'm just asking. So the only thing if I was faced with the porcelain aorta and I have cabbage plus mitral, at that time I need to use hypothermic uh, circulatory uh, fibrillatory arrest. Mitral plus cabbage. Yeah, because if it is cabbage is... alone, it's all right. Yes, yes. So again, you can definitely, uh, as long as, but what's, what's the caveat here? What's the, uh, uh, what's the uh, thing you need to make sure? You can, yes, I agree with you. You can do mitral valve replacement with a fibrillating heart, but what's the uh, uh, LB mandate? Venting. LB venting. It's very important. And uh, more important than LB venting. And time. No, no. aortic regurg. Exactly. No aortic yes. regurg, yes, uh, yes. Yes, Dr. Robert. No, so you, you, the only time you can do this is definitely, I agree with you. I've done it before. Yes. In fact, I did minimal invasive. Uh, at some point, I was doing minimal invasive, and then I stopped. But when, some of the times when it's very difficult to apply a cross clamp, uh, on the aorta or in a redo situation, and you're still insisting on this, you can do a fibrillating heart uh, mitral valve surgery, but you have to make sure that your aortic valve is competent. Otherwise, you'll be flooded. Okay. And what's the temperature usually? What I read is 28. 28. 28. Okay. 28. So usually, so you drift the temperature down to 28, fibrillate okay. the heart, and vent the LV. Do your distals and the proximals. You do them on you know, low flow or no flow. Okay. Uh, but but by the way, it's uh, uh, it's it has really been abandoned. You know, off pump really solved a lot of the issues, and uh, m more recently, PCI uh, has uh, has uh, you know uh, eliminated any clear indication for these uh, daring surgeries, whether replacing the ascending aorta and doing cabbage or doing a fibrillatory uh, coronary bypass uh, on pump. Uh, off pump and PCI has really eliminated the need for these alternative techniques. Okay, going back. So the most common solution that we, uh, intracellular solution that we use is, but Custodian. by the way, remind me, which one is intracellular, which one is extracellular? I think the long acting is the extracellular and the potassium. Intracellular is, intracellular. is the all. And extracellular. Oh, custodial. Is the, custodial. Okay, okay, okay. Custodial. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I might get my uh, number because I, I usually don't use custodial. I've only used it for the first time in my life uh, last week uh, on a long case. I have to say, I was very happy with it. I'm not that comfortable with it either. But uh, again, potassium, blood, cardioplegia. Uh, why give blood with potassium? 
uh, there is advantages of uh, avoiding uh, for avoiding the uh, it's more homogeneous one and it will give good uh, distribution to the coronary too and also uh, third things that uh, to avoid hemodilution and the uh, requirements of uh, hemoglobin uh, tra sorry blood transfusion mm -hmm. due to low hemoglobin uh, this is uh, this is uh, three and also in rich of uh, um, I'm sorry rich of um, Nutrients. Uh, nutrients and uh, scavengers as well. It works as uh, anti antioxidants. As a buffer. Power. So basically, and a good buffer. Buffer. Yes. buffer. Good buffer. Good buffer. Yes. Exactly. So I definitely uh, agree with all of them. So basically, uh, adding blood. So you, do you have to add blood? No. I've operated with a lot of surgeons who just gave, gave crystalloid cardioplegia. They did long cases, aortic surgery with just crystalloid, including uh, uh, Jabin al Khouri. Jibreen al Khouri is a world renowned surgeon. He operates yeah. on crystalloids only. Uh, uh, John Al Tariyad is my mentor in aortic surgery. He did all of his aortic surgeries with just crystalloids. So every 20 minutes, he would give 200, 250 of crystalloid cardioplegia. But I, I agree with you, it causes more dilution. Does it give less myocardial protection? At least overtly, no, because all of these patients came off bypass with uh, a viable myocardium. But again, theoretically speaking, giving blood makes a lot of sense. It gives nutrients, it gives oxygen, it, gives, it, it allows buffers to go in the uh, myocardium and uh, help protect the heart. Uh, uh, so what's the concentration can, usually if you're going to give blood cardioplegia? One blood to potassium four. cardioplegia. What's the uh, uh, ration? Four to uh, one. One to four. Oh, four, okay. four, four blood to one, one, one uh, crystalline. Yeah. So mo the most common is one to four, four blood, one potassium. Some people give eight to one. So uh, microplegia. The, 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 uh, uh, and there is microplegia, which again, I've seen it. I don't know. If Naskari, I think, do they still use microplegia? They use uh, the needle. The needle, but they mix the it with the okay. blood, but okay. Okay. And, and refers for um, one to four, one blood and four cardioplegia. One, oh, sorry, sorry, yes. Yes, oh, sorry, I made mistakes. Yes, one, one blood, then four cardioplegia. So basically, the Al-Askari, for example, they were using microplegia. Again, microplegia has the advantage as less dilution. So again, instead of giving, you know, one, uh, of, uh, four potassium and one blood, you're just giving small amounts of calculated doses of potassium within uh, the blood flow that you're delivering to the heart. Uh, the temperature of the cardioplegia, what temperatures uh, do you know? Uh, norm, uh, norm of the... Normothermic, oh, Normothermic and uh, as well as uh, hypothermic. Yeah, 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 hypothermic. is usually 30. And uh, hypothermic or, you know, cold cardioplegia is usually uh, less than 20. Uh, keep in mind that when the blood, into, uh, blood in the heart, uh, let, let's say cold, the uh, blood in the heart lung machine, what's the temperature? The temperature of the patient, uh, 36. In the heart lung machine, and you're giving cold cardioplegia. What's it's the temperature on, from? Depend on the temperature. What's the temperature of the cardioplegia that you usually give? Uh, minus four. So usually it's above, my, above minus, then four to eight, then they don't want it to crystallize. So usually they give it around, you know, close to zero Celsius. But by the time it goes inside your patient in the aortic root, the temperature is usually above 10. Yes. Again, because all the tubing, the line, the temperature, the ambient temperature in the room, the cardioplegia has to cross all of this before it goes inside the aortic root. And it still goes inside the aortic root. It still has to travel through the epicardial blood vessels. By the time it reaches the myocardium, it's much, much warmer than what it actually started with. Yes. So uh, at some point back in the day, if you uh, I've operated with some old time surgeons, they used to have a temperature probe stuck inside the left ventricular septum to ensure that yes. the temperature was, uh, that the myocardial temperature was, they wanted the uh, temperature usually 60 in Celsius. And uh, I, I, I've operated with some uh, uh, people who did uh, hook them. 
a hypertrophic uh, uh, left ven uh, hypertrophic uh, outflow obstruction. <clears throat> and they, if, before they did myectomies, they used to use a temperature probe in the interventricular septum to ensure that the temperature was at least 16 Celsius before they proceeded, uh, you know, they stopped the cardioplegia. So again, different modes. Usually what we say for, uh, if you give normothermic cardioplegia, how frequent do you need to give it? Uh, less frequent, so you general no, rule is... Normothermic, uh, normothermic. More, continuous. more, sorry, 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 more, more frequent. And usually more frequent. Like it continues so through. Continuous, some people people would give continuous. I usually say every eight to 10 minutes. Yes. Uh, if you're giving tepid cardioplegia 30 Celsius every 15 minutes. If you're giving cold cardioplegia every 20 minutes. All right. I have a question, Dr. Rakan, regarding the uh, normothermic, hypothermic, because I read, then I read different literature, there is no difference. However, in cases of cardiogenic shock, they mention that it is important to give it in, in initial induction, to give it as normothermic, and there is a lot of publication, but what is mm -hmm. your, uh, your, your, uh, uh, true, your true, comments true. about so this? Yes, absolutely. So fortunately, nowadays, we rarely operate on cardiogenic shock. We used to operate much more frequently back in the past. But nowadays, with the PCI and ventricular assistive devices, we're, we're less obliged to operate on these patients. Uh, so if you're operating urgently on an acute coronary syndrome, then there is some publication in Buckberg and his group. Uh, Buckberg is considered to be the father of uh, cardioplegia. All of uh, the initial cardioplegia literature in the early 1980s came from his group. And they found that an induction dose of normothermic or tepid cardioplegia was better for the myocardium than giving immediately cold cardioplegia. Uh, again, this was, this was an observation that he made. Now the question is, how much does this affect the overall function of the heart or the outcome? I don't think you can clearly say because I think the effect is very marginal. Even if it works, I think it, it has a marginal benefit, but it's definitely good to keep in mind. I use this protocol. So the few times I was forced to operate at cardiogenic shock, I usually gave my induction dose as normothermic or tepid cardioplegia, and then I shifted back to, uh, uh, to, to cold cardioplegia. So I definitely do agree with this. Okay, thank you. Okay, and now the mode of cardioplegia. So you have antigrade and retrograde. Antigrade is the one we all use, whether you're giving through the ostium or directly or uh, in the aortic root. Uh, retrograde cardioplegia, again, your, your probe is in the coronary sinus. Now, uh, any, any, any cautions uh, when you're giving retrograde cardioplegia? The, um, the pressure. You shouldn't so what's the usual the... pressure in the coronary sinus that you want um, to have? Let's, around 40. So usually, out of experience, I give 70 to 80, sometimes 100. But in the literature, when I was a resident preparing for the exam, they used to say 30 to 35. Uh, millimeters mercury. And again, this is not the pressure in the line, this is the direct pressure. If you see the retrograde cardioplegia catheter, there is a side line that measures the pressure. So I, I don't use it, I usually just lock it, but uh, ideally you should hook up a pressure transducer to that side port on your cardioplegia to exactly measure the pressure. Because the pressure from, from the perfusionist site might be 70, but inside the coronary sinus, it's much less. Because again, yes. the perfusionist measures the resistance across all the tube, from the heart-lung machine down to the connection. To, while if you measure the pressure directly in the coronary sinus, it's going to be much less because there's less resistance over there. So basically, I, I ask my perfusionist, because I don't want to waste time putting an extra uh, uh, pressure line. So I ask my perfusion, just keep the pressure above 70, 70 to 100. And usually that's, that's enough. Uh, any other thing about retrograde cardioplegia? Should be. Can, can, you, can, is, can you, can you, can you, we cannot use it, it and we cannot use it on uh, left, um, resistant left SVC. And it's Excellent. not, yes. so it's not to protect the, and we cannot protect the whole heart with only retrograde cardioplegia. The, there will be issue on protecting the uh, right ventricle. 
yeah. So uh, uh, de definitely uh, 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 right. So the retrograde is, I, from from my perspective, is an augmentation to integrate. You cannot rely on it solely. So usually retrograde is effective in uh, acute coronary syndromes, emergency cases, to allow for adequate myocardial protection. Uh, cases that where you have aortic regurgitation, moderate aortic regurgitation, uh, where you want to ensure that uh, enough cardioplegia reaches the myocardium. And lastly, when you're having complex cases, long complex cases where you're going to put retractors and you're going to fix the mitral and and do other stuff plus the aortic plus cabbage, mm. then this will buy you time. Instead of every time uh, put, uh, putting the heart down to give cardioplegia uh, in the root, you can give retrograde. Uh, redo so these with are the the patent memory. Retrograde. No? Redo with patent memory. Redo with patent memory, definitely, yes. Uh, again, it's, it's one of the ways to ensure that enough cardioplegia is delivered to the myocardium. But as you indicated, only so 30% of the cardioplegia that you give in the coronary sinus will go back directly to the ventricle through the Sabathian veins. So it's not going to go to the myocardium. 60% will go to the left ventricle, and only 10 to 15% will go to the right ventricle. So retrograde is not very effective in protecting the right ventricle. That being said, I've operated with some surgeons who relied completely on retrograde cardioplegia without giving anticrate. But the one thing they did is they keep giving constant, continuous retrograde throughout the case. So it's not like giving boluses of cardioplegia intermittently, but it was basically give cardioplegia. If you had the field flooded, for example, you're doing a mitral and your aortic root is flooding the, uh, the field with uh, dark blood coming from the retrograde, then you would stop it. But as soon as you had visualization or you were away from that area, the flood was coming, you started giving cardioplegia. Uh, my idea is uh, I use retrograde selectively, not in every case. Uh, I, I rarely or hardly ever nowadays use it in cabbage patients. Because again, you're giving cardioplegia every 10 minutes or even less. So you're, yeah, I'm giving frequent cardioplegia. There is no sense to me to give retrograde on top of the anti-grade. Uh, usually the cabbage cases are short. I mean, your, my cross clamp is less than 60 minutes. But I think one clear indication for me of retrograde cardioplegia, and fortunately we don't do these operations uh, quite often nowadays, is redo coronary surgery. As Hassan indicated, if you have a patent memory, now, if you have a patent memory, then that would be a contraindication to do a redo coronary surgery. But uh, let's say uh, somebody had all vein grafts and the LAD is patent, uh, the LAD was not grafted, then uh, using retrograde cardioplegia was shown to flush the debris from the epicardial vessels and the coronary grafts, the veins that uh, are on top of the heart. Uh, with all being said, I only use retrograde cardioplegia with aortic valve surgery and a complex surgery. Sometimes uh, when I, I, I'm doing a cardiogenic shock or uh, you know, uh, a, a, a patient who has unstable ischemia. The, the surgeon using the retrograde only, they, they, they add eyes on the, on the heart or they even yes, they don't yes, put yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Again, because uh, for the, uh, the retrograde is more going to protect your left ventricle and ice is going to protect your right ventricle. Okay. Hi. I think, uh, I think this is all. Hi, Alan, do you want to discuss scenarios? Okay. Okay, play. I'm going to discuss uh, some of the uh, common scenarios that we see. Uh, one thing uh, before I discuss scenario, what is your protocol coming off bypass? Yalla, Hussain, or Haytham? First of all. Well, Dr. Abayan, Bardo, come on, Maana, in the So first of all, uh, before coming uh, from bypass, uh, let's say I'm doing uh, cabbage cases. Uh, before start coming of uh, bypass, I need to be sure that all my graft, there is no bleeding, uh, all my suture line is okay, everything is okay. Then I will see the temperature. I will, I will ask for the APG to check the hemoglobin of the patient with the inotropic support that uh, I'm currently on. Then I, I start first to ask the perfusionist 
to uh, fill the heart. Uh, so the heart that uh, can start uh, pumping. Then I start go slowly. After shaking all this, the temperature is okay. Everything is okay. I have no uh, major issue in my uh, surgical field. Uh, start uh, filling the heart, start uh, ejecting for the heart. Then I will observe the ejection of the heart initially. Then I will go down slowly with, uh, with, with, uh, with, uh, with my flow, keeping my eye on uh, one uh, vital sign of the patient that including uh, the saturation of the patient, uh, heart rate of the patient, uh, plus the blood pressure of the patient while I'm going down with uh, my flow. If, if everything, and of course, uh, I ask an ABG, potassium level, uh, before doing that, uh, it is not high, everything is okay. And uh, if, uh, if all the parameters uh, with me uh, fine, I will go slowly, slowly until I'm off. Excellent. So, Dr. Raitan, now what you mentioned is absolutely uh, great and everything. But again, we're going to come off bypass every day we're operating. <laughs> so, it's like a checklist for the pilots in the airplane. Before they land the airplane, they have to grow, go through a checklist, uh, you, know, uh, a, 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 you know, point and tag. So what you said is good as a description, but you have to put it in a reproducible constant checklist because when you come off bypass the first time, you're gonna go through this checklist. When you fail to come off bypass, you go back again on full bypass and go again back through your checklist one by one to identify. <laughs> But the checklist that I've been using for the last 15 years, taught to me tab, by Chris Caldwell. Tab, tube, uh, temperature. Aywa, bazaar. So let me write it down. Let me write it down. Then Nuhadi is going to make your life easy. Not only in coming off bypass, but if you face any issues coming off bypass, you're going to go through this checklist every time you try to attempt to go on bypass and troubleshoot why your patient, why you're not able to separate the heart from the circuit, you go through this checklist. So lines, lungs, labs, temp, tape, and then the three piece. Prime, pump, pipe. Five, <laughs> Yes, but the last pipe. The three piece, prime, pump, pipe. pipe. Okay, so lines. You want to make sure that the lines are zero, then the blood pressure you're getting in the monitor in front of you is accurate because sometimes the line is dampened or you lose the line uh, when you're on bypass. Sometimes, especially when you're doing circuit arrest cases, there's vasoconstriction because of the hypothermia. The central, te central temperature might be okay, but the peripheries are cold and you lose your radial line. And until the patient is warm enough, you're not gonna be able to get a good reading. So you wanna make sure that the line is accurate. If you have any issues with your peripheral line, then either put a new line or uh, check the, uh, the pressure directly inside the aorta through a direct yeah. line. Lungs, yeah, I, I cannot tell you how many times residents forget to, to start the lungs up before coming off bypass. Labs. Labs, mostly you're interested in the potassium and hematocrit. You want to make sure that the potassium is not high because, again, it happened to me. It will happen to all of you. You try to come off bypass and the heart is not beating. Why? Because the potassium is too high. The potassium needs to be shifted. Uh, uh, hematocrit, less of an issue, but sometimes you need to hemoconcentrate uh, the uh, circulation before coming off bypass. Uh, Temperature, temperature is 34 or 32. You're not gonna come off bypass. And even if you do, the heart might fibrillate. And tape, it happened to me. I tried to come off bypass, no flow. Again, I went again, tried to come off bypass, no flow. The heart is not coming off bypass. Can you release the tapes? Al cavas, both cavas were snared. Okay. Oh, wow. 
So, and, and the three Ps, prime, pump, pipe. Let's suppose you're trying to come off bypass and the heart is not beating. You're not gonna come off bypass. So the, the pump, the prime, let's suppose you're trying to come off bypass the heart is empty, it's beating, but it's empty. You can see that it's empty. You look at your perfusionist and the venous reservoir is almost empty. You're not gonna come off bypass. You ask your perfusionist to drop volume so the heart can eject. And then the pipe, the pipe is the vasopressors. Sometimes the patient is vasoplegic or you need anotropic or chronotropic support. So you need to adjust the vasopressors. So memorize these lines, lungs, lap, temp, tape, prime, pump, pipe every time. And every time you have issues coming off bypass, check this list again and again. Okay. Okay? Okay. Okay. Now let me go through certain scenarios. Rest assured, for the oral exam, one or a bunch of these scenarios will come up. So, accidental decannulation. Stop the, stop the... People who are sitting, accidental decannulation. Stop the bump. Stop the, the pump. Okay. So what do you do? A patient decan. What's the first thing? Okay, you stop the pump. And you clamp. Actually, before the, you stop the pump. You clamp the arterial and venous line. You put the head down. Any put the head down. Anytime, Hussain, you have issues with your heart lung machine, what's the first thing you do? Regardless of whether it's pump clotting, decannulation, air embolism, what's the first thing you do? With the heart lung machine? Yeah. Any issues with the heart lung machine? What the what is the first thing you should do? Call. No. Call for help. I Gabel, you do this thing and then you call for help. I agree. Call for help always is uh, on the top priority. But uh, before calling for help, help. You you clamp the venous line. You stop the bump. Head down. Head down. Yeah. I say it. <laughs> Any issues you have with the heart line machine, the first thing you do is put the head down. Head down will allow you a couple of things. Number one is it will deliver more pump to the heart so that the heart can be pumped. It will protect the brain from air and from all other debris going in. So every time you get a yani, shock patient, and by the way, if you, uh, I am in yani, and, and the turn of the century, people didn't have vasopressors. So every time the patient arrested or became unstable in the operating theater, what they did is Trendenberg. This is where the idea came from, Trendenberg position. So the first thing you do is when you have issues with your heart lung machine, decannulation, uh, put the head down, call for help, and then Clamp the arterial and venous. Stop the bump. Clamp okay. the arterial and venous. <coughs> um, um, re re recannulate again, and drain okay. the, the the drain the um, um, the air from the arterial line if there is any air, and connect That's again. Excellent, excellent. So so so, so I, what I would do, and believe me, this happened to me a few times. It happened to both of us. Uh, so basically. Don't panic, but it, it can be a massacre. Uh, arterial and so all that arterial pressure can spread in the ceiling and everywhere. The المشكلة, المشكلة, it's it's gonna be okay if the heart is beating. Because if it's the heart is beating, it's just a matter of anesthesia, uh, giving uh, blood or giving volume to the patient that you're gonna restore, and this will buy you time until you uh, uh, reposition the cannula back in position and make sure that it's de aired and everything. Uh, the problem is when the heart is flaccid. Let's suppose the heart is arrested and then you get an accidental decannulation. Fortunately, that does not happen a lot because if there's any decannulation that's gonna happen, usually it's a technical thing. You did not tie the cannula strong enough. And usually it happens in the beginning of the case before you actually give the cardioplegia and start manipulating the heart, usually. Unless somebody accidentally pulls out the cannula. So. Again, if the heart is beating, it's okay. It's uh, just put the head down, call for help, clamp the lines, de-air, reposition the cannula back in place. 
If the heart is flaccid, this is when it gets more complicated. If the heart is flaccid, then you want to make sure that your anesthesiologist gives volume, keeps pumping volume inside the patient, and you massage your assistant. Now, you're going to be busy trying to de-air the cannula, but your assistant will be massaging the heart so that it keeps pumping blood. Because again, you have no blood, no pump. So you need to restore the circulation, the volume inside the patient, and keep pumping blood manually uh, through a uh, manual compression and uh, position the cannula. Dr. Rakan, you will, you will take the clamp or you will keep it? Uh, the clamp, uh, I would take off the clamp. Okay. This is why you want to put the head down. If you want to put the head down, because again, you cannot, if you have the cross clamp on, uh, yes, absolutely. You want to take the cl clamp out, put the head down, take the clamp out, uh, uh, push volume inside the patient and manually compress the ventricle until you get that cannula in place. Oh. And uh, remember, if you're cold, you still have time. You have 10 minutes. Yani, there is no reason to panic. Yani, the one thing you don't want to happen is you don't want to pump air inside the aorta. So this is why it's very important to have the head down. Okay, so, okay, another scenario, common scenario, you're in the middle of the case. Um, Dr. Can, can, no. uh, about this case, about this scenario, uh, also losing all this blood is, is an issue here. So uh, uh, we can also suck all the blood to the machine, the, keep it there until we return. The, 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 the problem is how are you going to give it back to the patient? After we recannulate, we'll give it back. Yes, you can, you can. But uh, <clears throat> the idea is until you cannulate, you need volume going inside that patient because all of your volume is inside the machine and you're going to yes. suck more volume inside the machine. What you need is you need your anesthesia is to pump through the central line, central venous line through the sheath, pump volume inside the patient until you get the... Uh, uh, and until you get uh, top of the volume inside the patient and manual compression if the heart is flaccid. But as I said, most of the decannulation happens immediately after going on bypass because a faulty, uh, uh, the cannula was not secured, right? And usually the heart is beating. So it's just a matter of uh, pushing volume inside the patient until you get. Now, in certain situations, uh, yani those of you yani, who scrub with me as Dr. Hassan knows, I do not tie off the venous site or the venous purse string until I take the arterial cannula out. Hussein, why? This is the um, uh, safety gate for you if you want to, to, um, to go back. So what happens? Let's, so what am I afraid? What happens? Let's suppose, you know, I'm taking out the arterial line and the aorta ruptures. You, you, you can stick what, the, what the arterial do? cannula in the, in, the, in the venous and you can give blood. And I do what uh, Dr. Haitham is suggesting. I put my uh, suckers inside the chest. <clears throat> now, uh, unless it's uh, a fully reversed, uh, if it's fully reversed, it's useless. But if, it's, if, I've, if I'm still uh, uh, you know, uh, within uh, um, therapeutic ACT, so basically what I do is I just take the arterial line and stick it in the venous uh, purse string in the right atrium and just ask the perfusionist to pump blood inside the right atrium until I able to get the uh, aortic rupture site under control. Yes. Wadha? Wadha. Yes, but, but if there is uh, aortic rupture at this uh, point, you will go directly to the femoral. Le right. No. The rupture. Uh, uh, rupture. Uh, let's suppose the end, when I say aortic rupture, I'm not talking about the aorta exploded, but if you're in the care, your purse string is not holding. Just uh, put okay. the finger. Yes, yes, put yes. Put the no. finger, no. Okay. but you're losing blood that end. Yes, That yes. blood has to go back to the patient. The heart is pumping, and then you're off bypass. Yes, yes. No, but no, you no. put your finger and yes. take the arterial line with put the right atrium. Yes, yes. No, and what? pump blood, and then take your time, يعني, uh, with, uh, يعني, being careful. 99% of the time you can control it without needing يعني, when do you need uh, to go to the femoral or another site of cannulation if you need circa rest to repair the aorta yes well, what most of the time you don't 
this is why I said ephemeral. What came in my mind, I section not uh, the bleeding from the side, which either finger or sometimes even partial clamp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Finger, finger, finger is the most, you know, effective tool they're going to have to control any bleeding. Just put your finger until you get things under control. But this is why I don't tie off my uh, venous purse string until I am secure, absolutely sure that the arterial site is secured and under control. Yeah, then yeah. if you take out, if you tie off the right atria, uh, the purse string, the venous atria, if you have major bleeding, there is no way for you to give blood, blood back to the patient without yeah, using the central line. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, the calm scenario. You're on bypass and uh, there is air in the arterial line. Okay, so same, uh, head down, call for help, stop the pump, clamp both arterial and uh, venous line. Then mm -hmm. uh, after that, uh, I will uh, take uh, the arterial line. Uh, I will, uh, I will uh, put that arterial line in the superior vena cava and do flushing. If I have a clamp, I will open the clamp out. And I will ask the anesthesiologist uh, to, to, uh, to, to bring the eyes, put the eyes on the, uh, on the head, uh, give the medication mm -hmm. for the patients uh, until I see flushing from my retrograde uh, perfusion that I'm doing through the SVC coming from the aorta, milking the aorta, be sure there is no more air. After that, I will resume the circulation, go, uh, I, I will ask after that, uh, the perfusion is to go in deep, uh, uh, sorry, uh, hypothermia. Uh, then, uh, of course, with the help of the anesthesia also, uh, to see if there is any uh, residual air in the arch or, uh, uh, or in the ascending aorta. Uh, then uh, slowly, uh, uh, yeah, deep hypothermic, uh, after that, if I finish from my case, at that, at, at that time, uh, patient uh, will go to the ICU. He will be uh, intubated on sedation for 24, 48 hours. If I have uh, hyperperic oxygen therapy, I can use it also as a, a, a adjacent therapy. Or uh, if I didn't do my, my, uh, my, uh, my case yet, so I will, I will do it uh, with uh, hypothermia. Okay, absolutely. So this is a textbook answer. So the key things is uh, stop the pump. First, so the most important thing is stop the pump, put the head down, call for help, take out the arterial cannula, uh, let blood come out from the arch, do uh, uh, cold uh, retrograde cerebral perfusion until you're sure that all of the air bubbles are out of the aortic arch and uh, the neck vessels, and then resume circulation under deep hyperthermia, finish the case, shift the patient to the ICU, sedation for 24 hours, 48 hours. So this is typically the textbook uh, answer. Um, should you do this with every case? The answer is no. I've had this happen to me, yani unfortunately. And alhamdulillah, the, the good thing is just, uh, was just to put the head down and stop the pump. So basically what I've done is I put the head down, I stopped the pump, I disconnected, I clamped the arterial line, disconnected the, uh, the, the cannula from the, uh, from, from the pump and just uh, allowed, the heart was beating, fortunately, we were about to come off bypass, allowed all of the air in the cannula to come out retrograde from the aorta and uh, my perfusionist flushed his uh, uh, circuit to clear all the air, reconnected the circulation and finished up the case. The patient was awake by the time we got to the ICU with no residual deficit. But again, uh, but you know, no matter what you do in these cases, the mortality is always very high, no matter what you do. But you have to memorize these scenarios for the exam purposes. And uh, yeah, hopefully you won't have to deal with it, but if you do, these are the things you, you do. Uh, how are we doing time-wise? scenarios. The one on the mitral, the one on the scenarios, like the heart lung machine. How are, how are we doing? No, 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 no. The time is yours. Nobody. Okay, so you guys are happy? Okay. Nobody. But, but if, if you can, are, can I just take? Can I take just a two-minute break to fill up my mug? 
يعني if you want even 10 minutes if you want 15 minutes لا لا خليها خليها 2 2 minutes 2 minutes انا وش وي لان عندي برضه كمان شغل بعد الظهر ف جست لم جست لم جست فيل ذس اب للمطبخ واجيكم جست 2 minutes طيب يا مرحبا 2 minutes break كل واحد يحرك يحرك الكالف فينز شويه طيب هيثم هيثم طيب اصلا ناخذها من البيت بسم الله Are we back online? Yes Okay طيب Next scenario air Let's suppose uh, uh, you're on bypass and uh, this happened to me So I was I was doing a, a I was finishing the case doing a lima to LAD, and uh, as I uh, I sutured the lima uh, to LAD. Usually w before I put the uh, last two stitches on the LAD, the backhand stitches, the lima to LAD anastomosis, I release the clamp, the bulldog on the mammary to flush the mammary. So as I did this, I noticed that the blood coming out of the mammary was dark blue. So I turn over and look at the arterial line and the arterial line is the same color as the venous line, if not darker. So what's, that, what's the problem here? Oxygenated, it's not working. Exactly, so either the oxygenator is not working or there's no oxygen. ف يعني يو كان انديرستاند طبعا لا البرفيوجنست نبهني ولا هذا برفيوجنست يعني الله بالخير ف بيسكلي سو ذير واز ذا اوكسجين ذا مين اوكسجين سبلاي كامينج اوت اوف ذا وول واز ديبليتد سو وات دو يو دو ان ذات سيتويشن يوجوالي ستارت تو فنتيليت ذا Uh, ask the anesthetist to uh, ventilate the patient. Absolutely. So again, you start ventilating the patient. So you need to deliver oxygen to the circulation. But do you think ventilation now is going to work? It's not. When you're, uh, when you're on full bypass? It will not be effective, but uh, it will buy me some time to, uh, for the... Okay. Yeah. So, so again, yeah. in order for, for the... the uh, to bring a new tank for oxygen. Okay. So in order for the uh, uh, lungs to work, you need to have blood flowing through the pulmonary circulation. Unfortunately, you're on bypass, you're on full flow. So even if the anesthesiologist ventilates the patient, yeah, the, the oxygen is gonna stay in the lungs because it's not gonna have gas exchange. So unless you start to come off bypass quickly and have blood being pumped through the heart, either, either the heart starts by itself or you start manually pumping the heart, you're not gonna get effective uh, oxygenation. Uh, any other suggestions? Um, cooling will help in this scenario? Not necessarily. Uh, you know, it, cooling will take time. And, you know, usually this, this problem can be fixed within a few seconds, usually, in less than a minute. 
So what does your perfusionist have in the operating room? Any, any cardiac surgery operating room? I will ask the, the perfusionist if there is, it is not connected uh, oxygen cylinder. So I will just Excellent. ask. Excellent. So, okay. So all, all, car all cardiac theaters should have oxygen cylinders standby in case the main oxygen supply wears off or there's some electrical shutdown. So basically what happened, and this is what happened in this case, the perfusion is just simply connected the oxygen cylinder to the heart mug machine. And the issue was fixed. So, uh, you know, some simple fixes, but again, you know, you need to be uh, to have a watchful eye. I, uh, uh, another scenario uh, is uh, you have clotting of the membrane. So the perfusionist, uh, by the way, the perfusionist will be able to tell you if there's clotting of the membrane because they can see the pressure gradient uh, uh, across the membrane. And if the pressure gradient is high, then that means that there are clots in the membrane. And sometimes, you know, when they sh shine uh, a, a torch or light on the, uh, on the oxygenator, they can see clots. So if there is a clotted uh, oxygen cylinder, uh, um, uh, oxygenator, what do you do? So it is affecting, uh, if it is affecting my, my oxygenation, at that time need to be changed. And okay. That How do you go about that? So if they will change an oxygenator, that means I need to have a pause of, uh, I need to stop the pump. But I will just uh, be uh, with a good communication with a perfusionist that exactly, and need to be, for him to be expert, uh, once he's ready to exchange it, because I think it, it, will, it will take 30 minutes. It's similar to the, uh, to the ECMO, so at that well, time. Well, yeah, um, listen, if you yeah, have so an experienced perfusionist, an experienced perfusionist can set up and prime in 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. I mean, you know, 30 if, minutes if there is, for somebody there is, I, I, I want uh, the exact changing uh, 30 seconds. Sorry, I said minute. 30 seconds? No, 30 seconds. So again, unless you have, so ideally, ideally, and this is, by the way, it doesn't happen. Uh, of, you if we have, have stand by, sorry to interrupt on yes. interruption. So, so if we have prime, if, so prime, if we, if we have standby um, um, uh, another machine, we, we can use it. Mm -hmm. Just to stop this ma machine and connect the... Um, in some center, they, they have multiple machine and multiple primed mas machines. So it can be used right away. So it will take a few yeah. minutes just to change the whole machine. Absolutely. So, uh, so if you have a... And most centers, big centers do have a machine that is connected, but it just needs to be primed. Most of the time it's not primed. Priming takes a few seconds. So just you drop in two liters of uh, Ringer lactate and uh, that's all you need. It's just you coordinate with your anesthesiologist <coughs> and how to connect and uh, 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 disconnect and reconnect. So this is usually the case. But sometimes is, uh, you, you, need, you need more time. So what I would do is, fortunately, most of the time when the oxygenator has clotted, you still have some oxygenation, but it's not effective. So you try to finish the operation as quick as possible and come up bypass. And this is mostly what you need to do. But if, if you cannot do this in a timely manner, then you coordinate with your anesthesia uh, perfusionist to get a new machine in and a new setup, depending if you have the machine primed or not. But we're talking about anywhere from one or two minutes to at least uh, 10, 15 minutes to get a new machine in sight. Okay. Uh, if I cannot well, do the both, if I cannot do the both scenario, I don't. I'm working in small center and I don't have other machine, and I have still I have time. I need time to finish my operation. Do you recommend changing the oxygenator and how long it will take? Yes, 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 yes. Because this is the only way. So, I mean, ideally what you should do in these cases, just try to come off bypass as quick as possible. Finish the operation, come off bypass as quick as possible. Uh, if you cannot, then you have to find a way to, uh, uh, to uh, you know, to limit the transition time. And you can still do manual uh, pumping of the heart until, you know, fill, uh, fill up the patient, uh, ventilate the patient and manually pump the heart uh, mm -hmm. until the new setup is connected. Okay. 
I want to ask uh, because I, I I didn't come across a case uh, in in OR that needed uh, to change the oxygenator, but in the ECMO it happened. So just changing the oxygenator is it visible like in the ECMO cases? Yeah, Only the oxygenator. The if so, if it all comes down here. We're in the operating room, next to ECMO, and in ECMO, the heart is beating. Heart is is already there. It's functional. Yeah. The problem is if you're in a case where the heart is flaccid, and the heart is not going to start just like this once you take out the cross clamp. It needs time. It needs at least five, ten minutes, depending on the situ uh, the operation, depending on the heart. So what do you do in that time? Uh, if, if you don't have effective oxygenation and circulation, your cells are going to die. The brain is going to die. So in that case, usually you either buy time until you get the new setup in place, whether it's changing the oxygenator or getting easier, much easier to get a new heart-lung machine set up, or manually pumping the heart and ventilating the patient from the anesthesia side until, okay. until you get things running. Clear. Okay, clear? Yes. Okay. Last scenario is you go on bypass and the perfusionist tells you that there is uh, high pressure on the arterial line. This happens to me a lot as uh, our residents know. <laughs> so, um, first of all, we have to check the first thing we have to check it is the line. There is no clamp. It's not uh, kinked or no, no uh, towel clip on it. And mm -hmm. you check it for all from the patient till the, till the machine because sometimes it's kinked on the, near to the machine. If it's, if it's not, yes. you, you, manipulate, you manipulate the cannula, maybe it's hitting the posterior, posterior wall. Yes. And keep, keep the, the possibility of um, aortic um, dissection. dissection. Okay. Well, let's suppose... I, 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 also check your, your assistant. Yani your assistant sometimes maybe his, his, his hand is, is on the arterial line. Yeah. So, Haytham, his so, I'm the one assisting him. So, so much, please. <laughs> <laughs> so, man, most of the time, most of the time when you have high pressure, it's, it's because there's a kink or there's a clamp on, on the line. And this is why it's very important that once you put the arterial cannula in place, and you check that there's no air bubbles in the line, you ask your perfusionist to test the line. Yes. And the perfusionist will tell you that line pressure is adequate, line pressure is not good. But sometimes that's not enough because uh, once you go on full bypass co uh, continuously, you will only be able to notice a high pressure in the line. And in that case, then most of the time it's positional. It's the cannula. I, I position my cannulas deep in the descending aorta, not in the ascending aorta. So a lot okay. of the time, if the, if the tip of the cannula is uh, pushed against the wall or the descending aorta is small, then you're going to have high pressures. So what you okay. do is just, just pull back the cannula or reposition the cannula and that issue would be solved. Obviously, after checking that there is no kinks or there is no clamps in the line. Uh, but let's suppose, no, you see a discoloration in the ascending aorta. Uh, other than discoloration, other thing that will tell you that there is a dissection. High line pressure, pressure and the drop in patient uh, drop uh, in patient pressure. And drop in pressure, yes. So you lose you lose you lose your arterial line, your radial line, yes. Anything else? Venous return. You have dropping in the venous return as well. Yeah, the drop, I don't think it's going to be much because, uh, you know, it, the blood that goes in the false lumen is not, is not large enough to affect your flow. But usually they say that there is blood in the urine. Uh, this is one of the signs of dissection. So you, you have a discoloration of the aorta, uh, you lose your radial line, and you have blood in urine. So that's a sign of, uh, of aortic dissection. And then you have to do a TEE to confirm. You have to do a yeah. TEE to look at the descending aorta to see if you actually have a dissection or no. Yeah. You so stop the bump, you, you do, do TEE. TEE. Now? You stop the, the bump, you do TEE. If it's confirmed, you, you cannulate peripheral 
and you start okay. to cool down mm -hmm. and then you open the aorta and assist. If it's only sm small dissection at the site of cannulation, it's not reaching farther to the, to the arch or the complete um, uh, ascending, you just need to repair th that, that spot, di direct suturing. If it's reaching all the way down or to the, to the arch, you have to deal with it as a, as a dissection. Excellent. So most of the time, iatrogenic aortic dissections, once you eliminate the cause, the dissection will heal. So the most important thing is recognizing that you have a problem and you have a dissection. You separate the patient uh, of cardiopulmonary bypass as quick as possible or uh, change the cannulation site. So basically, you either, you know, you have to, st you have to stop whatever you're perfusing through. So what I would usually do is, if I ever had this, is I would uh, try to come off bypass. Because again, this is going to happen early in the case. So the heart is still beating. So you can come off bypass and tie off the cannula site. And go this, at a peripheral cannulation site through the femoral and then perfuse. And I think that's enough for most of the cases. If you suspect that the dissection is no, is extending more proximal and it's big, then you have to do a circa rest and uh, open the aorta and do your assessment. But the most important thing is recognizing that you have an aortic dissection. How do you recognize that there's aortic dissection? Persistently high pressure, no obvious other cause that, like a clamp or a kink, a discoloration of the aorta, blood in the urine, and discrepancy in blood pressure. So once you recognize, uh, and TE, obviously, at the end, is to confirm the dissection. Once you have a dissection, then you have to stop perfusing through that, uh, through that cannula. OK. OK. Any, qu any questions about heart-lung machine uh, myocardial protection? You guys are OK? Yes. OK. Should we go to the next topic? Yes. OK. Right. Next topic. So, um, can I get the PowerPoint presentation, Dahin? Uh, okay, uh, awesome. just uh, go to share screen kindly. There you are. But then one participant can share at a time. Oh, no, 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 no. Share your screen. When you put uh, share screen, you, uh, it will come to you multiple. Uh, ah, multiple uh, so ah, choose okay, okay. which one. Okay, okay, good, 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 good. Okay, okay. No, no. Should I finish the screen? لا لا. You need to choose the one of the screen اللي طلعت لك. Ah, okay, okay, okay. The one you want to show us. Okay, now. Share. Yes. Do you see it? Yes. Yes. Now a beautiful picture. Okay. طيب. This is basically, this is a presentation I gave at the last Saudi Heart Association about the mitral valve. Uh, you know, I just want to go through this, you know, uh, practical things. I don't want to go through, you know, the didactic uh, uh, theoretical stuff. But uh, mitral valve is complex and uh, you really need to have a good, you know, in order to be a good mitral surgeon, you need to have a good understanding of the three-dimensional anatomy of the mitral valve and the function of the mitral valve the physiologic function of the mitral valve. Without understanding these, it's, it's very difficult because again, the mitral is a, is a 3D dynamic structure. This is one thing. The other thing is the mitral is like a gaugeometer, especially ischemic mitral, of the burden of ischemia and myocardial damage. Uh, a, 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 a ventricle, that ends up an ischemic ventricle that en ends up with severe mitral regurgitation is an end of the spectrum ventricle more than a ventricle that has ischemia and still preserved mitral function. So bear in mind that they're not the same patients. Yes, they're all ischemic uh, uh, MR or ischemic cardiomyopathies, but those who present with, myocard with uh, my my mitral regurgitation are much, much sicker and a more advanced spectrum than those who do not. So keep this in mind, at least when you're dealing with mitral regurgitation. Uh, I cannot overestimate and overemphasize 
how important the anatomy is. Anatomy is, is amazing. Uh, yeah, I mean, one of the things I do, and I hope you know, our residents do, I go actually to the anatomy lab, to the dissection lab, to once in a while familiarize myself with the anatomy. Then no matter how much you see it in nice drawings, illustrations, unless you go there and you actually feel it, you see it, you cut through the heart, you see the three-dimensional relationship. Because in the operating theater, no matter what you do, you're limited in your view. You're limited in the dimensions. Your time is limited. This is not the time for you to appreciate and uh, marvel at uh, how beautiful the anatomy is. So it's very important, you know, to be in the anatomy lab or at least buy one of these, you know, fairly adequate and representative models, cardiac models. I have one in my office. It's not the best, but it's the best one on uh, a reasonable price that I could find. But I do advise all of you, uh, as you begin your practice, uh, try to get a, a 3D heart model that you can keep in your office and marvel at, uh, at once in a while to identify the 3D structures. Uh, the heart is a complex organ. The muscles and the ventricles and the chambers are arranged in convoluted ways. And you really need to understand the, la the anatomic landmarks uh, as you proceed. The mitral valve, as we all know, is not just a valve. It's part left atrium, it's leaflets, it's subvalvular apparatus, it's papillary muscle, and it's ventricle. All of these work together to affect the function of the mitral valve, unlike the aortic valve. The aortic valve is just basically leaflets coming out of the annulus. The mitral, on the other hand, is more complex. It's leaflets only play a man, a, 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 a partial role in the overall structure and function. I'm not going to dwell a lot about the anatomy of the mitral leaflet, but I'm familiarized that the, the leaflet surface is usually the same. The posterior mitral leaflet constitutes two thirds of the, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the perimeter of the valve but the surface area is usually 50-50, anterior and posterior. Uh, the usual mitral valve in a physiologic state is saddle-shaped. Now, did this matter? No, it doesn't matter because again, this is the normal anatomy. What matters to me when I do my mitral repair is a functional repair. I need the mitral to be functional. It doesn't matter to me whether it anatomically it looks right or wrong, but this is the normal anatomy. Now, this is very important to understand that the, might, the, the relationship of the three valves together. So think of the, uh, the right ventricle as a flask shaped homer, where the narrow end is the, is the, uh, 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 the just let me just uh, log out of the screen here, just for a few seconds, the stop share. Do you see me now? Um, Yes, yes. Do you see yes. my screen? Okay. Uh, so, you guys see these? Yes. Okay. So the left ventricle is a cone-shaped structure where the inflow, the mitral valve, and the aortic valve are in continuity. They're just beside each other. The only thing separating them is this area called the aortomitral curtain. And when we do commando operations, we basically open the inflow and outflow in one big space and reconstruct the inflow and outflow. Yes. While on the right, the right side, The right side, no, it's a muscle that's flask shaped. The inflow is separate than the outflow. And the pulmonary valve is usually not directly related to the three cardiac valves that I'm gonna discuss later. And where the RV, the RV sits in front. So this is the LV, you know, and the RV, this is superimposed on the LV. So what you see when you, when, you're, when you open the pericardium is basically the, RF, uh, the RV, the inflow of the RV and the outflow of the RV in the pulmonary artery. The LV and the septum sits behind. 
and this is an important thing when you when you when you when you look at the echo or appreciate the anatomy is this important feature. Let me just back again to my. Uh, okay, so you can appreciate that the inflow and outflow are uh, are close to each other. Al pointer biban عندكم ولا لا؟ Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, what the pointer? Okay. So the mitral inflow, uh, sorry, the LV inflow and outflow, and here you have the aortomitral curtain. Now this is the relationship. See, the pulmonary valve is usually alafikra. It's not usually situated anterior. It's situated here, yani, uh, somewhere to the uh, to the left side. What you usually see is uh, basically the, the aorta, the uh, PA or pulmonary artery here, far away. This area is called what? Separating the uh, outflow of the pulmonary from the outflow of the aorta. What is this area called? Outflow of pulmonary and aorta. There you go. Again, the Quran. What's the area? What separates the pulmonary outflow from the rest of the heart? The, 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 the corners? The infundibulum. Is, an, is around, around a muscle. It is uh, the infundibulum. Infundibulum. So this is when, when you do the uh, Ross operation, this is what you dissect. You take out the infundibulum. Okay. So, uh, and then you have the, the three valves. So what I want you to appreciate here, uh, that will be the yeah. Why? Okay, just bear with me for a few seconds. Just uh, let me just. I did not save it. Uh, is my screen coming to you or just the presentation? Both. Both screens are coming? Yeah, we can see both. Okay, I want you to see this. Where is it? Okay, just hold on a second. Do you see this? What, what do you see? Do you see the uh, Word document now? Yes. Okay. شايفين ال 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 cardiac skeleton هذه اللي حط عليها pointer. Yes. Okay. So the cardiac skeleton is basically thickening of fibrous tissue that's incomplete that forms around the aortic, tricuspid, and mitral valves. The pulmonary valve has no skeleton. The pulmonary valve is basically leaflet coming out of muscle, which is the infundibulum. But the other cardiac structures mostly have a, a, a annulus, which is a thick fibrous part. And you can see it's the aortic annulus here, the mitral annulus, two horns coming down and are deficient here posteriorly. And this is usually why you have P2 prolapse uh, having more often, because that area is deficient in annulus. And then you have the aortomitral curtain, where the nadir of the nun up to the nadir of the left coronary sinus, extending downwards in a thick leaflet tissue to form the uh, anterior mitral leaflet. And there is thickening on both sides, the medial and lateral sides of the aortomitral curtain called what? Fibrous trigon. The fibrous trigon. And where the right fibrous trigon here, or the medial fibrous, tri uh, uh, medial fibrous trigon, meets the membranous septum, is called what? This area here where the AV nod, the bundle of his usually is. A membrana septum. Membrana septum. No, so the membrana septum fuses with the right fibrous trigon to form what? A How bundle of his, you mean? No, the the bundle of his is related to which structure? The bundle of his, uh, the uh, LV, an interventricular septum. 
Uh huh. And have you ever heard of the central fibrous body? Yes. Okay, so this is the central fibrous body. So it's the merging of the right fibrous trigon to the membranous septum here. Just imagine the right fiber, uh, the central fibrous body or the fibrosa as the merging of the aortic, mitral, and tricuspid annuli all in one spot. This spot yes. here. Yeah, this is okay. the one. And, and the rest is muscle. So just keep this in mind. This is one of the things that... Uh, this is the area injured as a complication with the three valve surgery. Aortic, mitral, uh, and yes. tricuspid. Yes, I mean, yes. So I mean injured, that, injured to the metabolic. It's usually a place that the uh, gigabus, uh, Okay, so usually it's it's an area that's uh, importance of because uh, there, uh, an infective endocarditis, it's an area that gets affected. And you just you need to know that the bundle of this resides over there and uh, the conductive tissue. So basically, this is this is mere important. But it's also important for me. It's important to realize that the three valves come together in one spot. Okay. Okay. So again, this is the annula. And uh, so this is the right and left fibrous trigons and the, you know, the circumflex usually, so the left main is short, uh, just behind the pulmonary artery, bifurcates to the LAD, which goes in the septum and the left circumflex that winds around the medial commissure. So right fibrous trigon, medial commissure, and usually in a, a, a uh, non-dominant so it, it just terminates to OM branches just before the uh, middle of the posterior leaflet. While on the uh, right side, you have the right fibrous trigon, you have the bundle of this close to over here, because again, this is the tricuspid valve. The uh, uh, AV knot is here uh, in the apex of the triangle of Co, and it gives the bundle of this just at the bottom of the membranous septum in the LVOT, and then it dips down into the ventricular septum into right and left bundle branches. And then you have the coronary sinus. Now, if you have a left dominant circulation, then that circumflex is gonna wipe around uh, the, uh, the uh, posterior annulus of the mitral valve. And if you're doing any serious mitral repair in a left dominant circulation, then you need to be careful in that area. Uh, the again, I, you guys all, all know it, the divisions of the anterior and posterior leaflet. But here, just realize the the extension of the. Obviously, you don't see this from the mitral side, but you have to know that the aortic valve extends from. Usually, this is not accurate. In fact, the usually the aortic valve is around this area here. Uh, cursor haggi. Yes. Okay. So it's usually, I would say, the aortic valve is from the uh, 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock position. This is your, where if you take a deep bite in this area, you're very likely to catch the left coronary sinus and, uh, or leaflet and cause AI if your bites are deep. So in this area, just make sure the tip of your needle is pointed downward and don't go too deep. And one of the things I do is if I'm taking, I usually don't use band uh, uh, rings in my mitra repair, but if I do use rings, this is why I don't like to use the intracellular long acting cardioplegia because I like to give anti-grade cardioplegia after I put my sutures to test the competency of the aortic valve. Because it happens sometimes that, not necessarily that you catch the uh, left coronary uh, cusp, but just a deep stitch can pull on the cusp and cause AI. And then you need to reposition it. The subvalvular apparatus uh, here, you can see that this is a, uh, this is not a surgical view. I think the surgical view is, yes, this is a surgical view. So you have an anterolateral papillary muscle and postromedial. The postromedial usually is a double head uh, papillary muscle. So it has, it's, it's stout, short, and has double head. 
the antrolateral is usually long and, and solitary head. It's very important when you're doing artificial cords in mitral valve repair to respect the midline, where you cannot put a cord from here and hook it up to uh, an area uh, uh, of a different to the area of the midline. So you have to respect this anatomical demarcation and the cords. Uh, I started doing a technique when uh, I have a commissural prolapse. I used to, in the past, close the commissure just to eliminate regurgitation in the commissure through something we call a magic stitch, Hagat Carpentier. But uh, I usually uh, lately resorted, and it worked, not necessarily with all cases, but at least the last case it worked, is a more papillary muscle relocation or papillary muscle head relocation, where basically if there is a prolapse in this area, you uh, relocate this papillary muscle to this by sewing them together. And basically you're pulling down on the subvalvular apparatus and restoring competency uh, to your uh, uh, commissure. This is important that when you're taking your bite in the mitral annulus, you need to make sure that your bites are deep enough. What you see here, uh, sometimes there is no clear transition zone between leaflet tissue and left atrial wall. And the actual annulus sits two or three millimeter deep to the endocardium. And the only way to tell that your sutures are in the annulus or not is through tactile sense. So it's very important when you take your bite, you get a feel because if you take it in the left atrial muscle, it's gonna, it's gonna be too floppy and it can cut through and cause leak. If you take it in the leaflet, you're gonna injure the leaflet. So the only way to make sure that you take it in the annulus is, is make sure that the actual annulus, the mitral, posterior mitral annulus is two to three millimeters thick and you get a tactile sense when you do that. The other relationship is here. You can see that the uh, left circumflex, now this is the posterior mitral annulus, is a bit further in the left atrial wall. So it's very difficult to catch the left circumflex in a, in, in a virgin territory, in a, in a heart that's been operated. In a redo, it's, it's very foreseeable that because you can, this is all fibrous tissue and de, uh, debrided uh, tissue. It's very foreseeable that you can catch the circumflex. But if you're operating on a fresh heart, unless you take a very naive deep bite, you're very unlikely to catch the circumflex. Uh, most of the time, but what we see is not necessarily the stitch catching the circumflex, but the stitch is too deep that it pulls and it kinks the circumflex rather than enter the circumflex directly. And then you have the coronary sinus here. Uh, this is the view. This is again to the orientation of the aortomitral curtain, the fibrous trigons here. Now, um, I don't know how much I need to dwell on mitral repair, but if I can make it very simple. So very important when you're other than understanding the mitral physiology and anatomy is understanding the pathophysiology. And the only way to understand pathophysiology is to have a, of mitral valve is to have a good eye for echo. I cannot re-emphasize and uh, emphasize the importance of familiarizing yourself with how to interpret echo, regardless of what is written in the report. Because again, cardiologists are not that experienced most of the time and identifying the difference between pathologies. All they can tell you is there is MR, there is MS, or there is mild, moderate. But it's your eyes that can tell you the relationship of structurally, the mitral valve, the function of the ventricle, and the overall pathophysiology. Let me give you an example. Let's suppose you have a patient with triple vessel disease, ejection fraction 30, 35%, and severe central MR. So this is one scenario. Versus a patient who has ejection fraction 30%, normal coronaries, and severe MR. Would you treat them the same way? No. Why? Okay, the first one, uh, it was normal uh, ejection fraction. Uh, what was, sorry? The first no, one, the first the one was one. 35. They're all the same ejection fraction, 30 to 35 percent. But uh, okay, one so, uh, and both of them have severe MR, severe. but one yes. has coronary disease and the other one has no coronary disease. Okay. What's with the, the one, prognosis? First? Okay, with the one without uh, 
uh, coronary disease, most likely it is myxematous. Uh, most likely it is myxematous micro no, no, ah, this is so both of them are functional MR. Both functional MR, not yes. ischemic. The first one, not ischemic. Okay, so the cardiologist have a look at how it is. What could have severe MR, could have functional okay. MR. One has coronary disease, the other one has normal coronaries. Would you do mitral surgery on both? I just, I just need history. The second one, yes, he needs mitral uh, surgery. The first one with ischemic, uh, with, uh, with a coronary artery disease, let's say it's a chronic artery disease, I need just to see the echo myself to be sure uh, this is a myxematous mitral valve. And if it is myxematous, so I will treat it the same. If it is, for example, it's an acute MI, that this patient came with acute MI, I need just because some of them, just because of the acute MI, they have drop Egyptian fraction and they have uh, this severe MR. And only with revascularization, they will be okay. Otherwise, I need to do, uh, I need to do, uh, I intervene on the mitral. But now the decision to do repair or replacement depends on. Dr. Rakan, the first scenario okay. will, will, the first scenario will, with ischemic will benefit more with revascularization and medical treatment, and the other one will, will benefit from the surgical treatment. So I take it from my both uh, senior residents and uh, doing your board that both of you are happy to operate on dilated cardiomyopathy. No, the, the, fir the first, sc the second scenario, if it's or orga organic, organic mitral and um, low- Kullam functional mitral. Kullam, you have LV dysfunction in both, ejection fraction 30%. One is oh, ischemic, sorry, sorry, the other sorry, one is sorry. dilated. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sorry, I hear you said functional. In my mind, it is uh, primary organic, sorry. No, so, no, 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 functional, functional. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, 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 my, this is misunderstanding from me. So first one, he needs cabbage plus mitral. The second one, I, I need to investigate why he has MR. Is it ischemic cardiomyopathy? Because this one, Oh, it's chemical. I'm going to tell you. So, a coronary, sorry, so sorry. A coronary I, angiogram, normal coronaries. There is no MR. Uh, there is no coronary disease. Yeah, yeah, no, no coronary disease with uh, severe MR. I need to know the etiology. Why? What's the etiology, etiology of is dysfunctional? LV, LV dilated with dysfunctional and there is MR. So uh, he will be very high risk uh, for, for surgical intervention. Allah, so you would operate? No. No, first he needs medical therapy, then CR. Excellent. Uh, so ICB, again, it is class, it actually it is class 2B. Unless all failed, at that time, I can do my trial. True, true. And nowadays we have the eclip. So what, what, what I want to tell you is you have two presentations, both of them heart failure patients, but completely different pathophysiology. And the prognosis is completely. The first one is reversible for the most part. Ischemic cardiomyopathy, if they have graftable coronaries, they are reversible. You're going to improve their symptoms. You're going to improve their survival. Believe me, if you operate on dilated cardiomyopathy with functional MR, chances are you're going to kill a lot of these patients. Number one, yes. they might not come off bypass because, again, the heart is dysfunctional. It's primarily myocardial dysfunction. Number two, their heart failure is never going to improve because the issue is myocardial. It's not the mitral. The mitral is just symptomatic. So my approach to both is completely different based on my understanding of the pathophysiology. If I have ischemic heart disease, that's a good sign. That means that I can reverse the pathology. I can add survival benefit to the patient and symptomatology. While the one with dilated cardiomyopathy with severe MR, even if I repair the mitral or replace it, that patient will still remain in heart failure. And it's best to proceed with medical optimization first, if necessary. Uh, nowadays, we have the mitral clip, which is less invasive, less risk of myocardial dysfunction and postcardiotomy shock. And if your hands are tied at the end and the patient is really, really symptomatic and all is failed and an e-clip is not an option, then I would consider taking a very, very high risk uh, patient for only symptom relief, not survival benefit. 
Replacing the mitral is not going to add survival to somebody with yes. dilated cardiomyopathy. Medical treatment will and might, and cardiac transplant for sure. So do you understand now? Yes, yes. In the beginning, I was thinking, uh, sorry, I, it was misinterpretation uh, from my side. Yeah. Very, so, and this is, again, this is why I, so usually the cardiologist is not going to tell you all of these details. The echocardiographer will never tell you these details. It's you who have to dig and investigate and decide. Ischemic cardiomyopathy, clear evidence of benefit. Now, should you repair, replace the mitral, intervene or intervene? There is some discussion going on, at least for moderate mitral regurgitation. But if you have severe, definitely, by all means, repair or replace. Uh, for myxematous mitral valve, you know, you guys know the techniques. Uh, and it's more art than science, uh, different techniques. Posterior leaflet is the easiest. Uh, Tyrone David used to say, whatever you do for the posterior leaflet would work. So the most common is quadrangular resection. I do triangular resection for the resected, uh, for the prolapse segment. Uh, uh, if you have a complete prolapse of the posterior leaflet, then you can do a sliding plasty, detach the posterior leaflet, resect the P2 and uh, reattach the posterior leaflet. For the anterior leaflet, the only thing, the best thing that works is artificial cords. Now, how far you gauge the cords and how you place them, different schools, different technique, there's no science to it. Uh, for the uh, for the commissures, usually it's a magic stitch. And anything in between, you just close. So this is for anterior and posterior uh, leaflet. Uh, for, um, for rheumatic mitral valve, now, the only time I would repair a uh, rheumatic mitral valve is if, it's, if the anterior leaflet is mobile, the patient is of uh, usually childbearing age female, and there is pure MR. All you need to do in these cases is just augment the posterior leaflet to restore the coaptation margin with autologous pericardium or bovine pericardium. And this will hopefully buy the patient a few more years until they come back for the definitive operation. Because giving them a mechanical valve will render them uh, uh, unsuited for uh, childbearing and giving them a tissue valve will subject them to a harder redo surgery in the future. Uh, again, the idea of repair of maximatus mitral valve is a functional repair. It doesn't matter how the valve looks. It looks like Frankenstein. It looks diff uh, terrible, but you need a functional repair on echo. And the idea of the, so the mitral valve is the anterior mitral leaflet. The posterior leaflet is basically like the door frame that holds the anterior mitral leaflet. So the whole idea of mitral valve repair is restoring a adequate shelf around the anterior mitral leaflet. Now in functional MR type one Carpentier functional MR, you undersize the annulus so that you restore coaptation. You undersize the valve so that you have better coaptation. In Meximatus mitral valve, it's the opposite way. You actually, the annulus is redundant and what you're doing, so the annulus is basically redundant. What you're doing, you oversize the annuloplasty so that the annulus is stretched and allows the mitral, uh, anterior mitral leaflet to co-opt. This is obviously Carpentier. And, you know, this is the uh, golden principles of mitral valve, Meximatus mitral valve repair. Number one, preserve leaflet mobility. Uh, especially the anterior, uh, namely the anterior, the posterior mitral leaflet after repair, it just becomes a fixed shelf. The whole idea is to restore the mobility of the anterior leaflet. And if it's too excessive, you bring it back in its place. If there's redundancy in the posterior uh, uh, annulus, you basically make it as a, a restricted shelf. Uh, restore coaptation. Usually you prefer not to leave the operating room with less than one centimeter of coaptation margin between the anterior and posterior leaflet. Remodel the annulus or restable the annulus. As I said, in functional MR, you undersize the annulus. In, uh, in maximatus MR, you overstretch and oversize the annulus. And the last rule is never leave the operating room with more than mild MR. And I would also add never leave the operating room with more than mild MS, which is very important. Sometimes you do a beautiful repair, but the gradient is high, is eight or nine. That's not a repair. Now you've converted the regurgitation to a stenosis. You basically close the valve. Uh, 
I think this is it. One thing I want to discuss is the issue of uh, repair versus replacement in ischemic MR. Any thoughts? Okay. In ischemic, uh, uh... <laughs> Go ahead. Henry. First of all, let's, let's, let's talk about the science behind it. Any uh, uh, clinical trials that you know of? Yes, uh, there is a there is a guideline. In the guideline, uh, it's two A to replace the VAR corridor sparing, doing corridor sparing, and two B for repair ischemic mitral valve. However, uh, there is some factor that can uh, make me go toward the repair than the replacement in ischemic mitral valve, which is a good target on the BDA and circumflex artery. I have no dyskinesia of uh, basal segment of the mitral of the mitral valve not severely dilated LV uh, or scarring uh, uh, left ventricle because that uh, will lead to the recurrence. Uh, the trial was done uh, with severe uh, mitral regurg, uh, ischemic mitral regurg, uh, repair versus replacement. Uh, the name of the tri CTSN uh, trial, there is Remy trial as well, and I think uh, FUTH also study. However, CTSN trial, there is no difference in mortality in two years, but there is a difference in uh, mitral the regurg, recurrence of the mitral regurg, which translate to uh, more heart uh, failure and more hospital, uh, sorry, more uh, rehospitalization of the patient but mortality the same in the two years. Remy trial, however, showed a better result than CTSN trial. The critique was on CTSN trial that showing no difference because uh, they were operating on uh, more viable myocardium. And also if you have a viable myocardium with good target, that will lead to uh, the repair. It, it is better because uh, in patient, in both uh, all all the all 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 the study that done on, on this sub uh, subject showed if you have a successful repair you have uh, reverse remodeling on the LV with the repair not with the replacement so it is depend on all these factor uh, to be analyzed before going and in the guideline two okay. A and two B. Right. How about how about moderate MR and cabbage? Okay. Moderate MR okay. and okay. cabbage, okay. you moderate MR and cabbage, you 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 repair the 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 general rule. You repair severe MR and cabbage, you you replace with cord with cord with cordial sparing, and there is as Haytham said, there is other factor pushing you to do replacement if it's um, a poor target on the CERC or uh, BDA. Uh, low ejection, very low ejection fraction, and uh, dilated ventricle, and the distance between uh, babillary muscle is more than more than ten or more than twenty millimeter. This will, in this patient, you you will be more aggressive and and replace. Okay, you allow me then also to add in the moderate is a controversy either to do repair or not, because the same rule yes. will apply on repair and replacement, even in the moderate, and it depends on the target. And one of the criteria, you, you look to the patient uh, symptoms. If he's coming with anginal symptom, symptom and with good target, uh, most likely cabbage alone is enough. But I'm, oh, and each patient, I need to see the echo, I need to see the CAD, and I need uh, to see all the picture so I can have a good judgment at the end. Uh, because even in the moderate, if you have uh, severely LV dysfunction, okay, initially maybe it's moderate because you don't have yet uh, the severely dilated annulus because of the L, uh, LV, but you have, for example, aneurysmal or scar on the basal segment. At that time, I would not go for the repair. According to the, to the, the literature, I will okay. go re yeah. replacement yeah. With, with, with that one. So when you yes. said only repair for moderate, I, no, 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 I don't uh, say that. I said the general rule. Uh, the general, general okay. rule, repair, but there's some factor will push you for replacement, not repair. The factor but, I said, the bore target, so, the LV function, so, and the space between the 
And so, uh, so as you said, an erosmal or scar. Yeah. So most of the time, and unfortunately in our practice, most of the patients come with uh, advanced stage of ischemic cardiomyopathy. And a lot of our patients who need cabbage will have some degree of mitral regurgitation. And the question in the New England study, the one that you referred to, they compared moderate MR, just cabbage alone, isolated cabbage, versus cabbage plus mitral valve repair. They did an annuloplasty. They didn't specify which technique of annuloplasty, but, and the bottom line, at five years follow-up, there was no difference in functionality, but the recurrence of moderate to severe MR was significantly higher in the uh, mitral, uh, in the isolated cabbage alone group. Uh, but there was a caveat, those who had uh, mitral repair ended up with a higher risk of stroke. Yeah. So uh, there was something to give. Now, over the years, ischemic mitral regurgitation is, is a very controversial topic, and uh, some surgeons are aggressive, some surgeons are cavalier. Uh, the data does not support being too aggressive, although I think if you follow them long enough, there will be strong evidence for mitral repair. But as Dr. Haytham indicated, it all comes down to how you view the ventricle, the scarring, the advanced disease pathology. So I've devised this algorithm. Again, it's not for, uh, for, for wide use, so please keep it confidential. But uh, it's one of the algorithms I've developed because we're, undergoing, we're doing research on this topic right now. And so basically what I, what I do is, do you have a screen? Actually, um... Yeah, واضحة بس صغيرة الخط. Uh, okay, don't worry, don't worry. Just uh, I'll I'll just point. So basically, if you have mild MR for somebody who needs cabbage, forget about it. Just do the isolated cabbage alone. If you have moderate to severe MR, then I usually do combined cabbage with mitral repair, keeping in mind how the patient presented. If the patient presented primarily with angina and their old age and they have multiple comorbidities, then I would leave the mitral and just do the cabbage. But let's suppose the patient presented with heart failure rather than chest pain, then I would be more tempted to do a mitral repair in these cases. But on severe, I would do a mitral repair. Uh, I, I would do a mitral intervention. If the mitral jet is moderate to severe, but the jet is central, meaning that it's type one, and the LV dimensions and diastolic dimension is less than 6.5, then an annuloplasty will suffice. A full ring annuloplasty, uh, size 26 to 28 millimeters will suffice and you will be fine. If the mitral regurgitation jet is eccentric and severe, then an annuloplasty alone is not enough. And you need to augment the mitral repair by doing extra maneuvers such as uh, ar artificial cords, uh, uh, papillary muscle sling, extension of the leaflets, or edge-to-edge -edge repair. Or you can just cut it short because this is gonna be complex. If it fails, you have to go back on bypass. Just replace the darn valve. If the patient has high risk, if the patient has dilated LV, if the patient has severe segmental wall motion abnormality and scarring, just replace the darn valve. Don't uh, muck around uh, and waste time on bypass and cross clamp, trying to you know, fix your ego more than fixing the heart. So this is the algorithm I go with and I'm very, very happy with it. Any questions? Okay, so this one uh, in editing, you want uh, to take uh, this uh, slide out because we are uh, recording uh, the session, Dr. Rakan. That's fine, that's fine, that's fine. Okay. It's undergoing research right now. We're validating this protocol uh, through my practice in the last five or six years. Oh, so okay. uh, just because this is, this is my own, pro this is my own protocol. Hopefully uh, we'll, we'll publish it, uh, you know, within the next year or so. Inshallah. Dr. Rakan, so you, you will not consider the, the BDA and circumflex target if it's good or not, or you can revascularize or not or any um, space between the papillary muscles or, um, <coughs> or, or any, any degree of um, LV dysfunction to differentiate between repair and replacement? No, 
well, definitely. If if if, let's suppose, the uh, the ventricle is just it's just a hypokinetic ventricle, but it's viable. It's global hypokinesia. Then that ventricle, if it's still in uh, preserved dimensions, I would do a repair, annuloplasty. If the ventricle is dilated, I would uh, replace the valve. If I have any doubt about the wall motion abnormality or scarring, I would just go ahead and replace the valve. So as a rule, whenever in doubt with the mitral valve and ischemic MR, because the ventricle doesn't look good, uh, the patient's risk is too high, then just replace the valve. You will not be faulted for that. But you will be in trouble if you do whatever fancy repair technique and spend uh, an hour on cross clamp other than doing the distal bypasses and try to come off bypass and your echocardiographer tells you that, or your anesthesiologist tells you that you have a severe residual MR. Or worst, patient goes to the ICU with severe residual MR, cannot be extubated because of recurrent pulmonary edema. You're in trouble. And Dr. Rakan, what's your technique of uh, re replacement? You will preserve only the posterior leaflet or you will preserve so, so, both? So as, as you said, no, in, yeah, my technique for all ischemic MR is I do transeptal rather than left atrial approach because usually with these cases, the left atrium did not have enough time to dilate. So uh, transeptal will give you the best access to the mitral valve in a small left atrium. Um, uh, so a, 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 a transeptal, and then what I do is I preserve the posterior leaflet. I don't usually in rheumatic mitral replacement, but in, in uh, ischemic mitral valve, as I would preserve the posterior leaflet, plicated, and I will debulk the anterior leaflet except for where the anterior, uh, the, the, uh, the chordae are attached in both commissures, and this incorporate that in my sewing ring. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Rakan. So it's called a bi-leaflet preservation. You're actually preserving the posterior leaflet, but not the anterior leaflet. You have to debulk the anterior leaflet in order for you to uh, place your anchoring stitches. Mm -hmm. so, so, I mean, with these ischemic MRs, usually, you know, if, it, if, if the ventricle looks complex, if there's significant wall motion abnormality, if the ventricle is severely dilated, if the patient is high risk because of other organ dysfunction, just quickly do a valve uh, replacement. Uh, if the LV is uh, preserved dimensions and the jet is central, then just a mere annuloplasty would be enough to restore your competency. Now, this is all again in ischemic uh, MR. Uh, in uh, in uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, I do my best to avoid operating on them. And if I do, I just go for a mitral replacement I don't waste my time with mitral repair because again, the ventricle is never going to improve. If anything, it's going to get worse after you repair. So just mm -hmm. replace the valve. And I usually, even in young patients, put a tissue valve because chances are they're not going to survive long enough to see a tissue valve decay once you have. So, I mean, my rule is uh, really try to avoid on, uh, of operating on dilated cardiomyopathy. And there are mm -hmm. other alternatives such as medical treatment or mitral clip. Dr. Rakan, so, um, in the book, they mention, or some surgeon, they, they will do, they will separate the anterior mitral leaflet and suture it to the posterior um, mitral leaflet and, and, uh, as a as preservation. Do you think this technique is, it will take for more which, time for, or for when I... Mitral or, for ischemic mitral or, or uh, rheumatic mitral? Yeah, this is my question, is when I can do this technique? So it's, it's, it's an old technique. I mean, these techniques were devised at a time where they did not have artificial cords. Cortex was still not in common use. People were not comfortable constructing artificial cords. So they used to use, uh, it was mainly devised for posterior leaflet repair, where they take a segment of cords from the anterior leaflet and transpose it to the posterior leaflet. Uh, uh, it was also used in um, aromatic uh, mitral uh, replacement where the cords are transported from the, anti uh, or the cordae are transported to the posterior. All of these, see, in aromatic, uh, you know, there is no need to do any of this. Uh, basically, all the subvalvular apparatus is fibrosed and thickened. You just take out all the fibrous tissue and replace the valve. Uh, mm -hmm. AV uh, groove separation is very rare because again, all the uh, subcordial apparatus is going to be fibrosed and thickened. So, you know, unless you do aggressive de 
uh, decalcification. Uh, usually you don't run the risk of AV groove separation. Uh, for uh, ischemic mitral, then yes, I'm a big fan of preserving the subvalvular apparatus, just debulking the anterior leaflet. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I used to do in the past, but I stopped doing this. Is uh, I do artificial cords on the, you know, uh, I take out, uh, I, I did it in rheumatic for a few cases. I used to take Gore-Tex and leave one and a half centimeter and uh, uh, suture it to the, to the sewing ring uh, when I tie my suture. Don't need to do that. It's a waste of time. Looks fancy, but uh, doesn't benefit the patient much. Thank you. I guess that's it. Uh, any questions? Any? Uh... Allah يعطيك العافية يا رب. الله. طيب شباب يلا بالتوفيق إن شاء الله وأي واحد يحتاج أي شيء أنا حاضر في الخدمة. الله يعطيك العافية. يعطيك العافية ألف شكر دكتور ركان. العفو عزيزي الله السلام. شكرا دكتور ركان. العفو. شكرا دكتور. العفو. My pleasure.